All right. Shalom, 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 everybody. Shabbat shalom. Baruch Hashem Elohim. Baruch Hashem Abaya. Baruch Hashem Adonai Hamashiach, or otherwise known as praise the name or bless the name of Jesus. Welcome to Fellowship of the First Resurrection Church. If you're watching us on the church website, welcome. If you're watching us on YouTube, welcome. If you're watching us on Facebook, welcome. And if you're watching us here in person, welcome. Is that a door lock? Yeah. All right. So again, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. This is our weekly Shabbat convocation service. And today's lesson is entitled The Epistle of James the brother of Jesus, the epistle of James, brother of Jesus, because James was Jesus' brother, and we are going to be dealing with uh, the book of James today for this Sabbath. So we're going to do an exegesis or a breakdown of the book of James. All right, again, sisters, we ask that you cover your heads. Brothers, we ask that you uncover your heads. Again, sisters, we ask that you cover your heads. And brothers, we ask that you uncover your heads. Right, and we're gonna open up with prayer in just a moment. Uh, I'll throw some Shabbat shaloms around. Let's see. All right, shalom, uh, mega old school shalom, brother Malcolm, shalom, sister Jennifer, shalom, uh, Sharuda, shalom, Project Yaz Garden, shalom, Donnell, brother Donnell, shalom, brother Daryl, shalom, brother Ryan. Shalom, DNE Sports and Games. Shalom, Sister Mary. Shalom, Sister Kimberly. I saw um, I saw in the Torah school this morning where you had put um, the fruit of your the first fruits of your lips. You know how we were talking about yeah, you can make that can be a sacrifice, giving your a spiritual sacrifice, and you give him the first fruits of your time, and you wake up in the morning and the first give him your first fruits. Sorry, that's in uh, Proverbs and in, uh, in Hebrews, <clears throat> but I saw that. That was a good scripture reference. All right, Shalom, Brother Thatcher, Shalom, Sister LaShonda, and all right, we'll get started. Let's uh, face Jerusalem. Y'all can stand and face Jerusalem. We're going to turn and face Jerusalem, and we're going to open up with prayer, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come together as members of the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters, to come together on the Shabbat as you commanded us to, to have a convocation and to grow closer to you. We pray, Father God, that this word that goes forth, that it'll fall on fertile ground where it'll be watered and nurtured and lead the fruits of repentance and works of righteousness so that we can make the kingdom and make the first resurrection. We pray, Father God, that we do not add to your word and that we do not take away from your word, but that we teach your word line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And we ask that you add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is a long lesson. I know we've been having long lessons, but um, so since it's a book, if it's looking, you know, we'll see. Hopefully we can get it done. But if it's going into hour three and we looking like we tired and we hungry, and all that stuff, then we can always pick it back up uh, next Sabbath. But I do not plan on doing that. I really want to just try to uh, knock it out. Look at it this way. One, when we have these long lessons, it keeps you from polluting Sabbath. That's why with the, even though I'd be tired during Torah school, it's I don't have a problem doing it because we don't, no way to pollute Sabbath. I got to be ready to do the lesson on Shabbat Eve for Bible study. Excuse me, and I already have to be in, mo in the mode for that. And we normally start that lesson before Sabbath has even officially started for us. And then by the time we're done, Sabbath has started. But it's still like 10, 30, 11 p.m. for us, right? So that's just basically time to go to sleep. Then you wake, and then I wake up in the morning. I got to do Torah school. And then by the time, and there it is, that little flying thing. But anyways, it didn't, I don't know if you see it. It just went by. If I see it go by, I'll try to smack it. It's somewhere in there. It's right there. It's right by you, in front of you. Over that side. It's, don't worry about it. You hear me? Okay. But yeah, it just went right by you. Um, but anyways, with uh, Torah school, by the time I'm done doing the Torah school, then it's time to just put on the clothes and hop in the car 
and go, like to come here to the church to do the lesson. By the time I'm done doing the lesson, if it's long, when I get home, because it's like a 30 minute, 30 to 35 minute drive from here, going back home, then by the time I get back home, Daryl's in, in the middle of his lesson or doing his lesson, and I got that, and then I take a nap, and Sabbath is over. So, you know, no way to pollute, no way to uh, pollute Sabbath, right? Now, let's um, look at Nehemiah 8 and 8 like we always do, right? And that's another thing, too. We were talking about spiritual gifts with Torah school this morning. Even that, like staying up for a long lesson, like someone, that's a spiritual sacrifice, offering a spiritual sacrifice. You know, sometimes, and and don't take, don't, don't take it the wrong way. Like if you, sometimes you do got to, lessons be long and you might need to take a nap or you got something else you got to do. And that's perfectly fine. Like when, before I started preaching and, you know, we would do that sometimes if it was a lesson and it was longer, sometimes that was the case. You know, we'd be in the lesson and, the, and going through it. And it's like, all right, it's been about an hour and a half, two hours. But, you know, I'm getting kind of sleepy. And, you know, you watch, that's the advantages of virtual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, you don't want to do that when you come, if you're in person. <laughs> but virtually, you know, yeah, you just pause it and, you know, come back later. Right? But um, enduring during the whole time, that could be considered a spiritual sacrifice. Okay? So Nehemiah 8 and 8. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to read in God's book specifically. We're going to be dealing with the book of James or the epistle of James. We're going to read in the Bible to understand the epistle of James. And we're going to read in the Bible distinctly, right? And make sense of what we're reading and cause you to understand what we're reading, all right? Now, our psalm for this Shabbat is going to be Psalm number three. Psalm number three. <clears throat> All right, Psalm number three. And uh, y'all can just read along, read along aloud with me, but you don't have to repeat after me. All right. And this is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son, right? Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of this holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. For thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right. So a rough, uh, rough quick theme of the book of James before we jump into this. All right. Keep these uh, themes and these topics in mind as we go throughout this breakdown. All right, you're going to notice this in the book of James. He talks about how the rich exploit the poor and how the rich op oppress the poor, right? And so how, how you shouldn't look up to the rich or desire to be super wealthy because he reminds them the rich are the ones who oppress you, right? And he was like, the poor people, the, the poor real Jews will be redeemed. That's another theme in here, um, as well, you'll see as we go throughout the book, right? And then he also focuses on how you need to work in conjunction. You need works. And let me put that in there, plural. All right. He also deals with how you need works in conjunction with faith. Works is keeping Torah slash the royal law. So he's going to break this down too throughout his entire epistle about how it's not just faith, you also need works. You need works and faith, good works. 
and he's going to tell you what good works are, which is the royal law are keeping the Torah, right? Now, I'm going to pull, uh, put the notes up. People on the email list already have the notes, but so everybody can see, we're going to put them up. Excuse me. All right. So we're going to open up in Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. And the reason we're opening up in Mark chapter 6, uh, dealing with the book of James, is because we have to find out who James is. So let's go to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. Notice here, Jesus is back in his hometown, Nazareth. And what is he doing? He's going to church. When is he going to church? On the Sabbath day, right? So just like us today. And what is he doing when he goes to church on the Sabbath day? Jesus is kicking book. It says he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom this man, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and of Judah, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended. All right, so notice there are the people in his hometown, the people he grew up with, the people he went to school with, talking about Jesus here, were all like they didn't want to hear they didn't want to hear nothing Jesus had to say. They didn't want to believe what Jesus had to say because they knew who Jesus was, right? They knew about Jesus, they knew about his background, they knew where he came from. And a lot of times it's like that for us too. You may go to your parents and your parents is like, Man, I changed your diaper. I've been reading the Bible since whoop de whoop de whoop. And it's like, who is this person, right? And then especially if uh, in Jesus case, he lived a flawless life. But in our case, you know, we haven't lived a flawless life. So sometimes your friends and people from the neighborhood and stuff, they know how you used to be. And then even now, how, even though now you're in the truth trying to be righteous, they still remembering how you used to be. And they don't want to hear none of the stuff you're saying because they still thinking about how you used to be. Right. So notice here, the people in Jesus hometown of Nazareth didn't believe in him, but they named his siblings because Jesus had brothers and sisters. So that's something else to keep in mind that a lot of people don't think about. There's literally people walking today that are, you know, related to Jesus. You get what I'm saying? Like you, your, your ancestry goes back to the brother of Jesus or the sister of Jesus, right? That's why Jesus was the son of man, right? Anyways, I digress. The seed of the woman. So notice here, one of Jesus's brothers is named James, right? So that's the one we're going to be dealing with uh, here today is his brother James, because his brother James is the one who wrote the epistle of James, right? It says here, notice what it says here in verse four, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. So Jesus said, a prophet is only without honor, where? In his own country, right? The Israelites, the children of Israel, the Jews, right? They killed all the prophets and they killed Jesus, right? Well, they, I'm not going to say they killed all the prophets. They killed most of them and they didn't listen to none of them, right? Hardly ever did they listen to the prophets, okay? So they were without honor in their own country. Then he says, among his own kin, you're going to be without honor among your own family, right? You know the stuff be, you know the stuff be true. <laughs> you know, so I'll give you an example. There's no reason, like for example, we have a church, like right. So there's no reason why we have. I have brothers and sisters. You did. I have brothers and sisters. I have parents. You have parents, right? There's no reason why they shouldn't be a part of our church, right? Mm -hmm. None of them are pastors, right? None of them are running a church, right? Mm -hmm. But I digress. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, and virtual audience as well too. Think about the thing. Think about the things I'm saying. I'm trying to make this plain, right? And then even with and then even with y'all on an individual level, 
Some of y'all have experienced that with family. You decided I'm going to fear God and keep these commandments, live righteous. You try to come to them with the truth, share them more stuff, share more stuff with them out of the Bible. And they don't want to hear none of that. Right. All right. Anyways, it says here, and among his own kin and in his own house. And sometimes it'd be in your own household, right? Now, I have here in the notes, James was born sometime after 4 BC. How do we know that? Because he's Jesus' brother and Jesus was born around 4 BC, right? So therefore, James has to have been born after 4 BC. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. All right. It's literally all that simple. And Jesus was the was Mary's firstborn. So, right. James died sometime before 69 AD, right? According to a passage found in existing manuscripts of Josephus, Antiquity of the Jews, section 20.9.1, right? And Josephus is a reputable source. He was a historian trained like me, right? So reputable source, excuse me, and he lived in a time, why are these bottles doing this now more? All right, nah, so Josephus says the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James, met his death after the death of the procreator Porcius Festus, Portius Festus, Portius Festus, but before Lucius Albinus had assumed office, which has been dated to 62 AD. The high priest Hanan bin Hanan, Anas bin Anas, Anan, I know how to pronounce that, but I'm not going to try to do it because it's the, Anyway, I'm not going to try to do it. Uh, and this man, and then is because sometimes I'm like, sometimes it's like you, it, it'd be like, this is the Hebrew way. This is the Greek way. This is the Aramaic way. And it's like, man, okay. I can't remember how to pronounce these uh, in all three different ways all the time. All right. Anyways, I digress. Took advantage of this lack of imperial oversight to assemble a Sanhedrin. Literally a Sanhedrion kit, kiton, kriton in Greek, a Sanhedrin of judges, right? So during this time of a lack of imperial oversight by the Romans, they, they assembled a Sanhedrin of judges, which condemned James on the charge of breaking the law, then had him executed by stoning, right? They had him, they had James condemned on breaking the law. This is the Sanhedrin. They're talking about breaking, quote unquote, Jewish law, right? Unless they're talking about Talmud, oral traditions, because that's not the law. As you're going to see, as we go throughout the book of James, there's no way James broke the law. James, even though this is in the New Testament, James makes it real, real clear. You got to keep that law. (laughs) He makes that. Him and John make that real clear. And John got a lot of books in the New Testament, too. People sleep on John, but he got four. Yeah. No, no, no. He got five. You feel me? All right. Anyways, I digress. He has the Gospel of John. Then there's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And even though 3 John is just one, um, one chapter. And then he has Revelation. I'm just double check ins. Jude. All right. Yep. Yeah. So he has five. All right. Anyways, John and James go in in the New Testament about you have to keep the law, right? So it says here the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin condemned James on charge of breaking the law, then had him executed by stoning. Right, Josephus records this in his Antiquities uh, 20.9.1. Josephus reports that Hanan's act was widely viewed as little more than judicial murder and offended a number of those who were considered the most fair-minded people in the city. And their strict 
and strict in their observance of the law, who went so far as to arrange a meeting with Albinus as he entered the province in order to petition him successfully about the matter. In response, King Agrippa II replaced Ananus with Jesus, son of Domenius. Right? Let's go to James chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. So James was martyred. He died for Christ, right? He died unjustly. Anyways, I, uh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just thinking about stuff. Like this, what do you think this God is going to do? I'm talking about Christ. When he comes back at his second coming, man, these people are crazy. These humanoids. That's what I'm talking about. These humanoids. So you killed Jesus. The humanoids killed Jesus. Then they killed his brother. You feel me? And you and then you put crosses up everywhere, the very thing that you used to kill him. And so when he comes back at his second coming, what do you think he's going to do to you? And his brother is coming back with him. Anyway, <laughs> I just like I just like you think about this stuff, man. You, you like the humanoids. We killed God and then we killed God's brother, right? How wicked is that? And specifically, what group of humanoids did this? My people, right? The Jews, right? They did this. Well, the children of Israel, right? Uh, he said, I, said, I don't teach out of the book of James. That's crazy. I've I've never heard someone say that. I've heard someone say that about Revelation yeah. and a couple other books, but not James. Not uh, not James. That's crazy. All right, James chapter one, and we're gonna pick it up at um, verse one. Maybe this lesson might explain why he didn't want to deal with uh, James. All right, because <laughs> James is gonna flat out tell you. Like I said, you got to keep that law. All right. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Notice here he also gives you his audience. His audience is the 12 tribes of Israel, but we'll get to that in a moment. All right. So the author of this book is James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So just to clear up exactly who this is and so there is no confusion. All right. It's not the father of Jews, not the father of not the father of Judas Iscariot mentioned only to distinguish his son from the other Judas. All right. It's uh, Luke six and 16 and Judas, the brother of James and Judas and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Acts chapter one and verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the brother of James. Right. It's also not James, the son of Alphaeus slash James, the less mentioned only in the list of the apostles. Right. Matthew 10. Mark chapter 3 and verse 18, Luke chapter 6, verse 1, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 65, and then Mark chapter 15 and verse 40. It's not James, the son of Zebedee, due to his early martyrdom around 44 AD, right? Which you can read in Acts chapter 12 and verse 2, right? So we know it's not James, the son of Zebedee, okay? All right, it's James, the brother of Jesus, according to the flesh. When we say here, according to the flesh, meaning James had both uh, had Mary as his mother and Joseph as his father. All right, remember, Jesus only had Mary as his mother. That's why he's the seed of the woman, right? So if you want to say half brother, you can, whatever, it doesn't matter, All right? But the point is, is James was the son of Joseph and Mary. Therefore, he is literally... In the flesh, genetically, Jesus's half brother. Okay. At first, he was a skeptic and a scoffer, right? During Jesus' earthly ministry. Let's look at that. Let's go to John chapter seven and verse five. Then we already read in the beginning in Mark about how James was one of uh, Jesus's brothers, right? Here in John chapter seven and verse five. It says, we'll pick it up at, we'll pick it up at verse one. 
After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. Notice here, Jesus' brothers, which would include James, are jostling him, right? They're like, dude, you, you know, if you really who you say you are, why don't you go out in the open? And they're saying that because they don't believe. His own brothers didn't believe on him. That's why it shouldn't be surprising, you know, like we talked about earlier, even with having a church and we pastor, and you know, but most families are not going to join our church, right? Same thing with Jesus at first, that Jesus' own family throughout his ministry didn't, a lot of his own family didn't believe. And the people from his own hometown did not believe. All right. He says there, it says there, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And then verse five says, for neither did his brethren believe in him. All right. So James at first didn't believe in Christ. He didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah. Which is crazy when you think about it. But again, you know, James is a, a humanoid, right? So. We humanoids will do what we humanoids do, right? So eventually, though, he ended up being saved, right? And he saw the risen Christ. This is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7. He served as a notable leader. In, he served as a notable leader, if not the leader of the early church. And the reason why we say if not the leader of the early church, because it's often assumed Peter, Right? was the leader of the early church. You know how people say Christ left him the keys, right? Not the keys to heaven, but to the church. So I don't get into schematics of who's greater because as Christians, we shouldn't be focused on who's greater and trying to be greater. So let's just say Peter and James both were fundamental in the early church and in leading it. You had both Peter and James. Um, dealing primarily with the children of Israel. And then you have Paul dealing primarily with the Gentiles. All right, I'm going to read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7. It says, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Talking about what? Let's uh, skip up to verse 3. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was, remember, anytime you hear them in the New Testament say, according to the scriptures, what scriptures do they mean? They mean the Old Testament, because that was the only scriptures that were around at that time, right? They're writing the New Testament, you know, as we're reading this, that's them writing the New Testament. So when they're referencing according to the scriptures, he means according to the Old Testament, right? Verse four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That means all of that is throughout the Old Testament. You know, Christ having to come at his first coming, dying for man's sins, being crucified, and then rising again on the third day. All of that can be read in the Old Testament. Verse 5. And that he was seen of Siophis, then of the twelve. All right, Siophis referring to Peter, then the rest of the twelve disciples. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. These are all the people who witnessed Christ being crucified and then witnessed him alive three days later, resurrected, right? As spirit being. Verse seven, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, right? So James, Jesus' brother, saw, him, saw Christ resurrected, and afterwards, he began believing on Christ, and he became a Christian. The reason why I say this is crazy. Think about this, what we're talking about here with these humanoids. His mom gave a virgin birth. So, and she believed. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. But he didn't believe. You, how does that work? Your mom knows how a birth happened, right? Mm -hmm. She knows, like, nah, this was an immaculate conception. And you are her son, right? You don't even believe your own mother, right? But anyways, take it with a grain of salt. This is my opinion. This isn't scripture. I'm giving, I'm, disclaimer, this is an opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. 
My educated guess would be James James and Jesus had like a Joseph with the other brothers problem. It was probably envy and they didn't, you, know, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, like how Joseph's brothers uh, were. All right, now, uh, this is also, let's just look at it since we're already over here. Let's look at Galatians 1 and uh, let's look at Galatians 1 and 19. All right, Galatians 1 and verse 19. Do, do, do. It says here, and actually we'll pick it up at verse, um, we'll pick it up at verse, we'll pick it up at verse 11. This is Galatians 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 11 to show you just the importance of James and how important James was and uh, how respectable he was during the time of the early church before he was martyred, before he was uh, killed. All right, but let's pick it up here at verse 11, because this is something I'm always telling you all about the Apostle Paul. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. All right, Paul here is letting him know the gospel that I learned, I didn't learn this from man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so you know how the disciples had Jesus Christ in the flesh? And they had to follow him, and it was the 12. And it, and we always focus on the 12. That was the group, the main group he had selected. But remember, there were other disciples that followed them and went along with them too, right? So that's not how Paul learned. And Paul didn't learn from another man. Paul learned from Jesus Christ himself directly, individually, not with another group of 12, not with a group of people. And he didn't learn from Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ was in a flesh and blood body. Paul learned from Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ was spirit being. That's another reason why Paul be confusing you humanoids, right? So, but anyway, I digress. Paul is like Moses, bro. Like people don't understand certain stuff. You know, you know how Moses got his instructions. We've been going in Torah school, and he get into stuff directly from Christ, the Spirit of Yah. That's the same way Paul got the gospel. All right, verse twelve. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous. Every time I read where it says, and wasted it, or wasted it in the Bible, I always think of the warriors. You know, the movies are worth wasted. All right. Is it being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers? Right. Talking about the Talmud and rabbinical Judaism because he was a Pharisee. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, another reason why abortion is sin. Notice here, Paul was separated and called from his mother's womb. Right. While he was in his mother's womb, God already knew this is what I got planned for you. Right. So who are we to terminate or abort that, i.e. murder? But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I may preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, right? Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus, right? So. Paul went into the wilderness in Arabia. And that's where he heard, that's where he was taught of God, right? For some time, literally taught by Christ. Okay. This is why Paul also tells you when he says, I know a man in Christ who went up to the third heaven, that's what he means. Christ. He doesn't mean himself or someone else, not another. No human being has ever gone up to the third heaven. And the Bible tells you this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Who have ascended up to heaven and who have come down? Only he, Christ, the one who are the one who came down is the same one who ascended back up, right? So when Paul was being taught by Christ, he literally saw Christ coming up and down. Christ come down from the third heaven, right? Teach Paul. Go back up to the third heaven. Okay. This isn't rocket, this isn't rocket science. Anyways, I digress. This is just learning on your learning on your way to learning. It says here in verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter 
and abode with him 15 days. So after he, after Paul was taught by Christ, right, for three years, it says what? What was the first thing he did? He went to Jerusalem to see who? Peter. This is why we talk about Peter and James being the main leaders of the early church. Not the, they are the main leaders of the early church. All right, so the first thing he did, he checked in with Peter, our office, and then it says, and abode with him 15 days, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. All right, he said, I didn't see no one else when I was up there, but Peter and James. And the reason he's letting them know this, the church at Galatia know this, is so that they'll respect his doctrine and respect where he's coming from. Because he's like, look, I checked in with the main ones in Jerusalem, right? The church is in Judea, okay? All right, Galate, let's look at, since we're here, uh, Galatians 2, and do we need to? Do, 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 and 12. Nah, we won't go. We won't, because uh, we, uh, we won't pick on Peter. We'll leave Peter alone. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 12 and verse uh, 17, though. Acts chapter 12 and verse 17. We won't pick on Peter. All right, but he beckoning unto them with the hand told to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. All right, so notice here, even when Peter was delivered out of prison by the angel, the Lord told Peter to do what? Go report to James. All right. This is again where I'm just showing y'all it's cold. Huh? Yeah. Just showing this just showing y'all the importance and how significant James is in the New Testament. People sleep on James. And James was Jesus' brother. Right. Jesus keeping it in the keeping it in the family. Right. Anyways, I die I digress. Let's look at um do do do. Let's look at Acts chapter 15. And we're gonna pick it up at verse 13. Acts 15, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. And literally, think of this. Some people walking today or walking around today have to be, there's people walking around today that are descendants of Jesus' family. You kin to Jesus. And guess what? Watch this one. Because of all the intermingling, right? <laughs> you know, someone may have not have, there's, you know, you're going to have some people who have direct paternal lineage going back, and that's only going to be someone who's of the children of Israel, Right? But as far as being related matrilineally and other way and you know other ways through mixing, they could be of anywhere in the world and of any group of people right now. That was like two thousand years ago, right? So you never even know you meet with someone you're dealing with, and it's like, man, this person's a direct relative of Jesus' family, and therefore a direct relative of Jesus when Jesus was in the flesh. All right. Acts chapter 15, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree, to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. All right, when he's saying Simeon, he's talking about Simon Peter. All right, verse 16. Because remember, Peter wasn't, a lot of them had names after the 12 tribes. And Peter, that wasn't, remember, he got the name Peter from Jesus. Right? It means rock. Peter, Siophis, right? You have the Aramaic and the Greek version of rock, Peter and Siophis. All right. So it says there in verse 15, And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. All right? James is James is the one who gave this decree, right? In verse 13, it said, and after they had held their peace, James answered, right? So James had a lot of authority, him and Peter, right? And you can even read to where Peter deferred to James, right? So that's why we say, 
Peter and James were pretty much the leaders are the ones in charge of the early church after Christ ascended back up to the third heaven. Okay. I also have here in the notes, even the apostle Paul recognized and submitted to James authority in matters of preference, right? Let's look at that. Acts 21, and we're going to pick it up at verse 17. This is probably why that preacher that make old school is talking about didn't want to preach out of James. Because if Paul is deferring to him and Peter is deferring to him and is making him like the final authority in the New Testament after Christ, you know, went back up to the third heaven and he's Jesus brother, right? In the flesh. And if he tells you numerous times, you got to keep the law. That's probably why they don't want to deal. That's probably why they don't want to spend time in James. Oh, the other one besides that is because they lie and tell you you don't need works. And it, that's why <laughs> sorry I'm laughing about this, but it, it, it's hilarious to me because literally, I, and I mentioned this last night, we take no L's as a church when it comes to doctrine ever. Why? Because I just read to you what's in the Bible. I don't get up here and have to lie to you about nothing. Do you get what I'm saying? When you tell somebody that it's not about works, ha, 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 no, nothing no works can save you. You don't have to have works. It's all been done for you on Calvary. Just to all confess your sins and, and believe on Christ and you'll be saved. That's all you have to do. Ha, ha, ha. Right? Well, when you read in James over and over and over him talking about that you need works and that faith without works is dead and that you're justified by works, right? How you, huh? Yeah. How do you explain that? How are you going to explain that to the people you teach? What kind of lie rabbit you're going to pull out of your hat for that, right? So, you know, we'll just avoid the book of James. That's, that's what they end up doing, right? Anyways, I digress. And then the only time, because even at least that pastor was honest and saying, I'm not going to go to James because you don't want it. Other ones don't either. They just don't tell you. They only go to James once in a blue moon and they cherry pick like a couple verses. You know, I'm talking about our passages out of James. But anyways, I digress. We try to teach not try. When I say try because we're humans, you know, do we do to the best of our ability? But we teach the whole Bible here, everything from Genesis to Revelation, even down to circumcision, whether you like it or not. If you're a man, you must needs be circumcised. I didn't say it. Christ said it. The Bible said it. All right. So let's just pick it up here in verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following Paul went in with us. Let me say one other thing, too. Because, like, uh, I got something. Remember the one brother sent us the thing where the Muslim dude about eating pork and he was dealing with the Christians? They're like the, the debate. All right. They are, you get what I'm saying? The reason why Christians lose debates and people who believe in Christ and, they, and other people think, oh, there's contradictions and all that stuff is because you don't deal with everything in the Bible. If you just deal with everything in the Bible and accept it on face value for what it says, then there are no issues. There's no issues. There's no contradictions, right? It flows seamlessly, right? But you have to deal with everything in here. You can't take something out. You can't change anything, right? You have to deal with everything in here. If you deal with everything in here as it is stated, there are no contradictions, All right? Let's pick it back up here at verse 19. I mean, verse uh, 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us on to James, and all the elders were present, right? I'm going to pick it back up at 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Notice here, Paul went in unto who? Unto James, right? And he made, he made sure to note that he saw James excuse me, and the rest of the elders, but make note that he saw James. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Notice here, they said many Jews believe. That's another misconception that a lot of people have. They think that when the gospel was going forth during the early church period, that the Jews didn't believe. No, a lot of the Jews, a lot of the Hebrews, a lot of the Israelites believe, right? So think of it this way to show you how much they believe. If it's not 
if it's not an epistle of Paul, right? Minus Hebrews, because Hebrews, that's another one to the children of Israel. All the other epistles are pretty much to the children of Israel. Right? So that lets you know, too, that's the audience, right? So that lets you know there were lots of, there. it wasn't just Gentiles and the heathen that were coming into the truth of Christ, right, in the New Testament. Many of the Jews believed, okay? And they were also zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou for for they will hear that thou art come. Notice here, they're telling they're telling Paul, like, man, there's lots of Jews here and they're zealous for the law. And they think that you teach people that they don't have to keep the law, right? And this isn't talking about the this isn't talking about the sacrificial law. They mentioned exactly what it is here they're talking about, right? Circum circumcision, right? That was one of them. Verse 22. What is it therefore the multitude must needs come together for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Notice what they said to him here. And it's James and the elders, right, of the church, the early church, all right? And notice what they said here to Paul. And they told Paul, you need to join with these people on this vow for what? So that the other Jews can see that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepeth and keepest the law, right? Because Paul didn't Paul didn't teach that you didn't have to be circumcised. We've covered this. He says in Galatians uh, chapter five, right? If I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted, right? So again, Annie tells you what profit is there in circumcision much in every way, right? So you got to know what he's talking about when he's talking. Sometimes circumcision is taught. Sometimes when Paul is talking about circumcision and non-circumcision, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Jews being circumcision and the Gentiles being non-circumcision. And he's not even talking about the foreskin thing, right? That's sometimes, Okay. Then other times when he's talking about circumcision and non-circumcision, he's talking about circumcision of the heart, meaning your mind, right? And then when he's talking about circum when he is talking about circumcision in the flesh, when it comes to the Gentiles, he just makes the point for the Gentile brothers, for the Gentile men, that there's absolutely no point for you to get circumcised in your flesh if you are not going to be in covenant with Christ and fear God and keep the commandments. Because you're going if you're gonna do the law, you're gonna be a debtor to the whole law. If you're gonna keep the law, you got to keep the whole thing. And so Paul is like, there's no point for you to get a surgical operation done, unlike the rest of us, because most Hebrews, we got circumcised when we were a baby, right? Even today, the children of Israel, even my people, most of us get circumcised. My mom made sure I was circumcised. And if and our people over there in Africa, you best believe they make sure they get circumcised. So that should have been done when you were a child, right? But it wasn't. So now you got to get circumcised like Abraham as an adult. And don't think Abraham got circumcised when he was like 100 years old, 99, All right? So anyways, sometimes Paul is talking about that and telling the Gentile, telling the Gentile men, you don't need to get, there's no point for you to get circumcised in the flesh. You don't need to get circumcised in the flesh right now because if you're not going to keep the whole law, you being circumcised in your foreskin is not going to get you into the kingdom. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Thank you. It profits. Not, it will profit you nothing in that case. Anyways, I digress. And remember, in this same book of Acts, just to prove this point scripturally, line upon line, precept upon precept, in this same book of Acts, we'll go there. We shall bring it out, as they say. You know what I'm talking about? Bring it out. Acts chapter 16 and verse 1, line upon line, precept upon precept. 
Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. So this is Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek. So his mom was a Jew. His father was a Gentile, was a Greek. And according to the Bible, according to Torah, according to Hebrew custom, not Talmud, not Ashkenazi, right? But Hebrew custom, you are what your father is. That's what determines who you are, right? That's how bloodline determined lineage, genealogy, birthright, it goes through the father, right? So Timothy was Greek, a Gentile. Notice what Paul is going to do, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him. So Paul wanted Timothy to come with him to do the work, right? But before Paul took Timothy with him, what did Paul do? He circumcised him. Paul circumcised him himself. Use common sense, people. No, for real, use common sense, people. Do you know what circumcision is, right? This means Paul cut off Timothy's foreskin himself. Do you think Paul, do you think a man that's going to cut off another man's foreskin is playing around with circumcision? Come on, all right? Like, this is the stuff, all right? We got to make it plain, man. We have to make it real plain. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Why did they make the point to say they all knew that his father was a Greek? The point is, is that make, they knew he was a Gentile and they were watching Paul to see, are you going to circumcise this dude? Because he a Gentile. We done heard that you teach the Gentiles that they don't have to be circumcised, right? Anyway, this is all side note, learning on your way to learning. This is what Bible study and convocation is for, for us to learn and study in God's word. All right, so let's go back now to Acts chapter 21, and we're going to pick it back up now at verse um, 24. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and all may know that, thou, that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So the early church here confirmed keeping the law and you need to get circumcised. All right, verse 25, okay? As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication, All right? Notice here, James is the one that Paul went to and deferred to his authority. I also wanna point out here, when they said, tell the Gentiles just to observe these things, we know that this is not saying this is the only stuff that they have to keep, right? The reason we know that is murder in here. No, right? You can't murder someone and no one in their right mind is going to tell you that it's okay to murder someone, okay? No, what happened here is just like some of y'all when y'all first came into the truth, right? Even if you came from Sunday church, if you came from a Sunday church and they weren't too savage, you might have a little bit of an advantage of knowing some stuff in the scriptures. But you still got to learn all these commandments in Torah, just like we going through Torah school. That's going to take a whole year. You feel me? And that's just going, that's going to take one whole year. So they can't teach them that stuff all at once. And they didn't have, and it's going to take us a year and we got internet and we got technology and all that and Google and all this stuff. You feel me? All right. Think about the stuff that I'm saying to, I'm trying to make this because people don't be, People don't be understanding what was going on in early church times. That's why you got to have the historical context too, right? And you got to pay attention to what you read, okay? All right, I digress. So they tell the Gentiles a few key things to focus on. If you want to know exactly what they taught them, then go into Paul's epistles, right? Into the epistles. We're going to, even though James wrote to the, uh, is writing to the Hebrews, right? Even though he's writing to the children of Israel, it's still the ones that are scattered. We read that in verse one, that are scattered amongst the Gentiles and the heathen throughout the diaspora, right? So it's the same thing. James is going to tell them what? To keep the Torah. You feel me? When you go into the book, what did Paul tell the church at Corinth? Them Gentiles, keep Passover. Did he not? 
What did he tell them? Then keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What did he tell them at the church in Colossians? Keep new moon, right? Keep the Sabbath days and all the holy days. And don't let any of these Judaizers judge you in regards to meat offerings and drink offerings because Christ was the drink offering. That's why you keep the Passover the way you keep the Passover with the cup, which symbolizes his blood as the drink offering. And then you take the bread, which is the bread offering, right? Or the meat offering. Anyways, I digress. Okay. So that's all they were doing. That's all they're saying here. Okay. This is just for now, Gentiles focus on this till we can instruct you further. Because giving them the full, you know, Torah rundown, you know, fearing God, keeping the commandments, how to do that, that could take years. All right. Verse 26. It says, then Paul took them in and the next day purifying himself when with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So notice here, Paul did this, right? Why did he do this? He deferred to James in verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us onto James and all the elders were present. Okay, now. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. The last thing I have here in the notes, James descended from King David on both his father Joseph and mother Mary's paternal line, okay? All right. Wait. No, no, I got to go one more. The audience. We're not going to Acts chapter 2 yet. I had to do the audience. All right. Then we go to Acts. Then we'll go to Acts chapter 2. All right. But... Last thing I just said there, James, do, do, do. James was a direct descendant of King David on both his mother's side and his father's side through Joseph and Mary, right? So I have here in the notes for the audience, it said in James chapter one, and I'm going to read it again, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So who is he writing this to? The 12 tribes scattered abroad, the children of Israel. That's his audience, okay? His audience is not the Gentiles, but that doesn't mean the Gentiles don't, that doesn't mean the Gentiles don't read this. I know that's a double negative, but I don't care. The longer I've been out of college, the stupider I get. <laughs> Here's what it is. The longer, longer I've been away from, longer I've been out of college and all that stuff, the, the stupider, the stupider I get, but it's whatever. Yeah, it's it's whatever. I I don't even stop caring. Like it's just, I just even stop caring. All right, the twelve tribes of Israel. All right, that's who he wrote it to. The Gentiles, though, it's it's supposed to read this. The heathen, everyone is supposed to read this. It just means his primary audience, who he wrote it to, is the twelve tribes scattered abroad. All right, so I have here in the notes the the twelve tribes of Israel in the diaspora. North and Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm putting where they were at that time, right? Because the transatlantic slave trade hadn't happened, and so there wasn't going to be a lot of us over here in the Americas at that time, right? Not to say that there weren't, just saying it wasn't going to be a lot, right? The 12 tribes of Israel, and the reason why I say that is because we've been dispersed to the four corners of the earth, so we got to be everywhere. Once the dispersion happens, we're going to be everywhere. All right, so it says the 12 tribes of Israel in the diaspora at this time, that would be North and Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Indochina. If you don't know what Indochina is, that's South Asia, South and Southeast Asia, um, Central Asia, Oceania, and, uh, and like China too, right? But especially like Southern China. Uh, Oceania, Oceania, that's like Australia, uh, the Solomon Islands, uh, Fiji, um, New Caledonia, Tahiti, New Zealand, all that stuff. Hawaii, even though it's a part of the United States, that's still part of that Oceania region, right? Asia Minor and Southern Europe, okay? From Assyrian and Babylonian, I have their Chaldean deportations slash captivities because the Roman one, the Roman disbursement hadn't happened yet, right? Because uh, when James is writing this, because remember, James is killed before the Roman invasion in 70 AD. All right. Second Kings 18 and 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel onto Assyria and put them in Hala 
and in Habor by the river of Gozon in the city of in the cities of the Medes. All right. So I have here in the notes Central Asia. Thank you. Because if they were put into the cities of the Medes, the city, the Medes were in northern Iran, but they were also in Central Asia, going up into what would be the southern Russia or um, the former Soviet republics. Okay. So you have here the children of Israel being placed in Central Asia via slavery, right, during the Assyrian captivity. And the reason why we're going over this is because this is the audience that James is writing to, the 12 tribes that have been scattered, right? So we're giving you the context of where they've been scattered to, okay? Esther chapter 8 and verse 9. Esther chapter 8 and verse 9. We're going to read that really quick. At the rate this is going, this probably will be a two-part lesson because I've been wanting, I've been, uh, but we'll see. I want to break down, I want to break down this uh, book. I don't want to skip parts or leave stuff out. All right, Esther 8 and 9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies. Notice here what Mordecai had written unto all the Jews, okay? And this is all the Jews throughout the kingdom of Persia, throughout Persia's domain, because Persia was the, the Medo-Persians were the ones ruling the world at this time. This is after the Chaldeans and before the Greeks. And it says here in verse 9 of Esther 8, and rulers of the province, which are from India onto Ethiopia. Notice here, all the way from India onto Ethiopia, okay? 120 and seven provinces. So from South Asia, Southeast Asia, all the way to Sub-Saharan Africa or Ethiopia. And 120 and seven provinces onto every province, according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language, right? Why was it according to the Jews and according to their language in all these different provinces? Because you had Jews living in all 120-something provinces that the Persian Empire had, okay? Stretching all the way from India, so South A and in ancient times, India is meant the same thing as India and the Indies, right? So in South Asia and like Southeast Asia and the islands over there too, in maritime Southeast Asia. So from there all the way to Sub-Saharan Africa, you had the children of Israel. This is their dispersion, okay? In Acts chapter 8 and verse 27, this is just another example here. Of, this is just another example here of them being in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. It says, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, right? He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Why? Because he was a Jew, right? But where did he live? He lived in East Africa, and he was a eunuch, which means he probably got there in captivity since he was a eunuch, right? Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed. Notice here the daughter of my dispersed. James' audience in James chapter 1 and verse 1 was who? The 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Scattered and dispersed are the same thing, okay? Where are the children of Israel dispersed to, it says? From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that's sub-Saharan Africa, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering, right? So you have their sub-Saharan Africa with the dispersion. This is who this audience is. This is who James' audience was, the entire dispersion. He didn't name a specific part, right, of the dispersion. He named the whole dispersion. Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch and Saul, right? So notice here you had Simeon, right? And he was from Niger 
And that means exactly what it means, right? He was Nigerian from Nigeria. We have lessons dealing with that. That's not a game. That is fact. <laughs> like, that is like literal, that is fact, historical fact. And there was an empire and a kingdom called Nigeria at that time, right? Anyways, I digress. So that's West Africa. Then you have Lucius of Cyrene. That's Northern Africa. That's from like Libya, right? So we have here West, Central, and North Africa, right? First Peter, one and one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Right, so here Peter, when he wrote his epistle, his epistle was to the twelve tribes scattered into a specific area. James' epistle is to the twelve tribes scattered throughout the entire diaspora. Peter's was focusing mainly on who those living in what is now modern day Turkey. Right? Excuse me. I digress. That's what I Asia Mer, Asia Minor is. Right? Acts chapter eighteen and verse two. And I found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, right? So you had Jews living in Italy, Hebrews living in Italy, the children of Israel in Southern Europe, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them, right? So you have them in Southern Europe as well too, All right? Now we're going to go into Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 will pretty much sum this up. Of all the places, give you an, just even more of an example of all the places they were coming to. So on Pentecost, they're all showing up to Jerusalem to worship. Why? Because it's the Feast of Weeks. It's a commandment in Torah that they do so. Let's see where all these people were coming from. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. All right? Notice here. First of all, why is the church, this is the Christian church, right? Why are they here on Pentecost? Because they keep in the feast days, because that's what a Christian is supposed to do. All right? So they're all gathered there, right? Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, meaning angels. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. So how were they able to speak in tongues? Angels came and helped them do it, right? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When it says here other tongues, that means other languages. It doesn't mean ooga booga. It doesn't mean gibberish. And it's not glossolalia. They were speaking in other foreign languages that the people could understand. You know, like Persian, Arabic, Greek. It wasn't humana, 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 humana. Yeah, I digress. Verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Notice there, notice here, who was there? Jews, right? This is who was gathered here because at first the early church was only Jews, only Israelites. Remember, they didn't start dealing with the Gentiles till after Acts chapter 10 because Jesus told them specifically to go to the children of Israel first. He has a protocol. God has a protocol with everything, and you have to abide by the protocol. The Jew first, then the Greek. It's like that with everything. It's like that with the reward and the punishment. The Jew gets punished first, then the Gentile. The Jew gets rewarded first, then the Gentile. All right, verse, it just is what it is. Verse six. So there's Jews from every nation under heaven, it says. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, all right? Parthians meaning Persians. Medes, we already covered who Medes are, right? Elamites, okay? That's Elamites, that's going to be, uh, if you want to be technical, 
That's going to be Southwest Iran. But if you want to be technical, by the time we're talking about here in New Test New Testament times, the Elamites had already migrated to Sri Lanka. But anyways, that's just side note, learning on your way to learning. And the dwellers in Mesopotamia, that's Iraq, and in Judea. So if it's talking about the Elamites, if it's talking about actually where the Elamites had migrated to, because they had already lost where they originally lived, that would be Sri Lanka. So that would be South Asia and, you know, Southeast Asia, Indochina. All right. Anyways, I digress. Just learning on your way to learning. All right. And in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus in Asia. So Turkey, Phy Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya. So Africa about Cyrene and strangers of Rome. So Italy, Southern Europe, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. When it says there are Jews and proselytes, remember, it already told you in the beginning, everyone here was Jews, right? Devout men. So, and again, Jesus tells you, and it tells you in the gospels, a proselyte, a proselyte wasn't a Gentile convert, right? They weren't going in onto Gentiles like that. You know, we've covered that in Q&A. And if someone needs that clarified, again, just ask it when we do Q&A this week or send it in as a question because we've covered that. But the Bible tells you in the New Testament that proselytes were Jews or Israelites, Right who have forgotten their culture, forgotten their customs, and have been living like Gentiles. And so they have to be reconverted back to their own culture, right? That's what a proselyte, that's what a proselyte was. Cretes and Arabians, right? We do hear them speak in, a, Crete is in the Mediterranean. And Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So this is James's audience, the 12 tribes scattered literally pretty much everywhere, okay? When it mentioned Pentecost here, Pentecost is Shabbat or what is known as Feast of Weeks, okay? You must keep these things. They are commandments. Let's go to James chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 2. James chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, and entire, wanting nothing, right? So I have here in the notes for verses two through four, we should rejoice in the divine purpose of your trials, all right? So whatever you're going through, the Lord has a divine purpose in that, okay? And so you should rejoice in it and be patient. And you should look for opportunities to, you know, work and exercise your patience instead of getting mad. You're in the grocery store and the line gets long and they spilt pickle juice and you got to wait. You know what I'm saying? Glorify in patience. You know, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to just wait instead of getting mad. It's, you know, you on the freeway instead of road rage, patience. Instead of you zoom, zooming, switching out of every lane, not letting someone get over. You understand what I'm saying? Patience. Christians have patience, okay? Verse five, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. All right, so he's telling you here, if you're a dummy, ask God to make you smart because that's the one thing God will give to you liberally, right? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the hand, with the wind and tossed. So when you ask, you must ask in faith. You got to believe in what you're asking, right? And not wavering. You don't want to waver. You don't want to be a double-minded man. Verse 7. For let, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, right? So if it says here a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, that means you don't want to trust them because they're unstable, okay? And for the brothers, you don't want to be double-minded. You don't want to be double minded. That's not good for being a husband, a father, or a leader, leading a household. You don't want to be double-minded, right? You make a decision, stand by it. If it goes bad, it goes bad. You feel me? Man up. That's part of being a man. Make a decision, stand by it. All right. You don't want to be double-minded and you don't want to waffle. All right. Now, 
And if you need wisdom with making a decision, that's why he said, ask God for wisdom and he will give it to you. So I have here in the notes, ask Elohim for wisdom to endure your trials with joy, right? So when you're going through things and you have to be, and you're, and you're exercising your patience, ask for Elohim to give you wisdom as you're going through those trials and as you're being patient, okay? And he'll give it to you so you can make sound decisions, okay? Let's pick it back up here now at verse nine. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away, right? You know how they say the word ass is in the Bible. You know how they say your ass is grass, right? I mean, because grass, you know, you put grass in the trash. You burn grass. You cut grass. Grass gets cut down, right? So he's letting you know here, don't put faith in your riches, right? Because eventually you're going to die and you can't take them riches with you. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass. And the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it persisteth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Right? I have here in the notes, as Christians, we should not desire to be rich. Right? That doesn't mean being rich is a bad thing necessarily. And it doesn't mean you becoming rich is a bad thing. But as Christians, we should not be desiring to be rich. That shouldn't be your goal. All right, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And there's a reason for that. It's very difficult for the wealthy to make it into the kingdom. The Bible tells you that. Because most people, the more money they have, they're just going to use that money to sin. All right, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, when it's saying here, endureth temptation, endureth the test, right? And also, even when you are tempted with actual temptation, when you don't give in to it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The crown of life that's been promised to them that love them, that love Christ is what? Eternal life. Notice here, you're not going to get eternal life unless what? You overcome the test, right? You want eternal life, you got to pass the test. All right, I have here in the notes for verse 12. The reason God tests you or puts you through trials, right? That's the reason why God, this is the reason why God tests you and puts you through trials. It's to prove you. Right? Don't we cover that all the time? He tests you to prove you. Why did he leave those enemies for the children of Israel when they came into the promised land? To prove them and to test them, to see whether or not that they would learn war and also what? To see whether or not they would keep his commandments. Right? Let's pick it back up here now at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. And think of it this way too. That's a eternal life is a gift. It's a reward. You don't just give a reward for nothing. I don't know. Maybe parents do that now because parents are weird and they don't tell kids no. But normally, you know, the kid got to do something to get a reward, right? Don't you got to do the allowance? He got to. I mean, he got to do his chores in order to get to it. In order to get the allowance, he got to get good grades in order to get the reward. You want to go to Chuck E. Cheese? Pass the test, right? Same thing. Same thing with God. He's not going to just give you the gift. He's not going to just give you the reward freely. You have to pass the test. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, hath bringeth forth death, All right? Let's go to Proverbs chapter two, and we're going to pick it up at verse six. So remember here how you said, ask Elohim for wisdom and Elohim will give it to you liberally, meaning much, he will give you much wisdom. He will not withhold it. Let's go to Proverbs chapter two, and we're going to pick it up at verse six. Proverbs chapter two, and we're going to pick it up at verse six. For the Lord giveth wisdom, right? So Yahweh giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. 
right? So if you need wisdom on something, who should you be going to? The Lord. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. You want knowledge on what, on what to do? You want understanding on what you should do? Then go to your prayer, co prayer closet and seek the Lord, and he will give you knowledge and understanding. Read his Bible, which is also his word, and you will get knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. Notice here, for the righteous, if you fear God and keep the commandments, he's waiting for you to come to him. This is why it said in James, why James said he will give you wisdom liberally, meaning he will not withhold it from you because he has wisdom stored up to give you, meaning he's waiting for you to come. That's why even when we did the lesson about complaining and murmuring, that's why he wants you to come to him with the complaint. He's waiting on you to do that so he can give you the solution, all right? He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the ways of the saints, all right? Notice here, he preserveth the ways of the saints. So if you're a saint trying to live righteous, fear God and keep the commandments, he preserves your ways. So seek him for wisdom on the way that you should go. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, direction shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. I right, notice here the evil man who leaves the path of righteousness. So he was once walking in righteousness, but then decides to stop being righteous. All right, verse 14. Who rejoice to do evil who and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger, which flattereth with her words. The reason, and now he's giving you some examples of why you want to seek the Lord from wis for wisdom. So you can avoid situations like this. So you don't get caught up with a knucklehead who wants to do evil and is going to end up causing you to do evil or causing evil to come upon you because you didn't seek the Lord for wisdom and make a good decision, right? Here, now he's talking about to keep you from the strange woman. And we can apply this for the sisters too. There's men, you don't want to get caught up with a strange man, with a man who's going to come, just like how there's a woman who can come and destroy a man's life. There's a man who can come into a woman's life and destroy her life too. So it'll, yeah, wreck her whole life. You know what I'm talking about? Usually in the form of children and he be gone. <laughs> but anyways, I, di I, di I digress. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 18. This is why you want to use wisdom, 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 right? Wisdom, All right? Verse 18, for her house in... For her house inclineth on to death, and her paths on to the dead. None that go on to her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of right of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. Again, the Lord wants perfection. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Right, those that sin, those that transgress God's law are going to be destroyed. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 4 and we're going to pick it up at verse 18. Hmm? Yeah. Well, now you're going to warn. Well, Mark chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 18. Mark chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Notice here, this is the parable of the sower, right? So it says, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, word right? So people who desire to be rich, they are equated to thorns when the word is sown, right? Thorns are not good. That's not good fruit, okay? That means you're not coming up. You're coming up with weeds, right? That's not good fruit. 
So it says here in verse nine, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it become unfruitful, right? So it's letting you know here that if you just desire to be rich and you desire material things, that'll choke out the word in you, okay? And then you'll become unfruitful. And if you're unfruitful, you won't make the kingdom because what happens to a branch that doesn't produce any fruit? It's going to get cut off and you're going to toss it into the fire, right? Now, let's go to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 23. Mark chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 23. All right, Mark chapter 10 and verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered, answereth again and saith unto them, the saith unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So he says it here again. Okay, so he said in verse 23, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And this again, this isn't rocket science either. So Obviously, if I'm trying to get eternal life and he says it's hard for someone who seeks riches to get eternal life and then it's hard for the wealthy to get eternal life, then I'm not trying to get wealthy. Is that hard for me to it's not hard to figure out, man. Right. So anyways, and if you have a problem under if you have a problem understanding that, then that means mammon is probably an idol for you. Okay. And again. Doesn't mean you don't want to, it's not talking about living comfortably and all that and making sure your needs are met and your bill. All that's great. This is talking about people who desire to be super wealthy. Like that's your main goal in life. I want to be a millionaire. I want to have millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and I'll do anything to get money and I'll do anything for wealth. That's what the, that's here what Jesus is talking about. All right, verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, right? Let's go to Genesis chapter four. And hopefully I don't need to interpret that, right? Some people talk about how there was a gate in Jerusalem that the camels had to crouch down to get into and it was very tight, right? I take it at literally what it says, uh, eye of a needle that you sew with and I know how big a camel is and so that means it's impossible, right? Yeah, doing something strange for some change. That is what uh, people who, uh, yeah, who desire to be wealthy, oftentimes that's what they end up doing, right? Got something in my eye. All right, Genesis chapter four, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Right? Why is Cain's countenance fail? Didn't we just read here in James? It said what? Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You're going to see this same thing James talked about play out here with Cain in the Torah. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, meaning he was angry. And his countenance fell, meaning he was depressed. And the Lord said unto Cain, unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thou countenance fallen? So Jesus asked Cain, why are you depressed and why are you angry, right? I guess. My string looked like it came out. All right, verse seven. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Notice here he says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. That means if you keep the commandments, if you do what I say, if thou doest well, right? Good works, because this is a theme throughout the book of James. Good works, right? 
So here the Lord tells Cain, if you do good works, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, right? So again, you have to have works to be accepted. There's requirements, right? There's no such thing as come as you are. I'm repeating that. The Lord didn't tell Cain, oh, it's okay, whatever you bring to me, I'll accept. Come as you are. No, that's not how it works. That's not biblical, okay? That's not even kind of in the Bible, All right? Verse seven. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, meaning be disobedient, sin lieth at the door. So if you continue to sin, what's going to happen? Sin lieth at the door. Why? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, right? Remember, James said, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see this here in verse seven. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him, right? Verse eight. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. I am I, my brother's keeper, All right? So now he's lying to Jesus' face and he murdered someone. Sin lieth at the door, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, All right? So he was being disobedient in what he thought was a light matter, the offerings. You know what I'm talking about? He didn't want to do the correct way with the offering. That could be in today's, in, in, in today's terms, you know, you want to give, but you don't want to tithe. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He said tithe, 10%. Okay? Anyways, I digress. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear, okay? So again, then, as it said in James chapter one, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, All right? Let's go back now into James chapter one, and we're gonna pick it up at verse 15. James one and verse 15. And when he had, and when, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, right? Literally what happened with Cain. 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us, with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. All right, so notice here in verse 16, it said, do not err, my beloved brethren. I, I don't feel like I want to make this point. Notice the thing with Cain, though, and what he just said here, and what James just said here, and how we talk about a little sin, a little leaven, leaven up the whole lump. Sometimes you can have, you can start off with a small sin, and then it leads to a bigger sin, and then that stumbling block comes that it talks about in Ezekiel, and that's meant for you to stumble over and you die, right? That you don't want, right? So you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself, okay? Like literally, check yourself before you wreck yourself, and you end up, you continue in sin, and then it goes too far, and then the Lord end up just taking you out, all right? So in verse 16, it said, do not err, my beloved brethren. What does he mean here? All right, do not sin or transgress Yah's law. All right, that's what James means. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Okay, let's look here in the notes. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 24. Who gave Jacob for a sort for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law, right? So what was sin? What what was the definition of sin here? Because it says here, he, he against whom we have sinned. So how did they sin against the Lord? It tells you. 
for they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Right? So when you're not obedient to God's law, when you're disobedient to Yahweh's law, that is what sin is by definition in the Bible. Okay? All right. Let's look at another one. Jeremiah 44 and verse 23. Jeremiah 44 and 23. Because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord. All right. Who did they sin against? Elohim. Right? How did they sin against Elohim? And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, so they didn't obey him, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes. So they didn't keep his laws, judgments, statutes, and commandments. That is what sin is, okay? It says here, nor his testimonies. Therefore, this evil is happened unto you as at this day. That's something, another thing people don't like to deal with, but it's in the Bible, right? Right? A lot of times evil come upon you because you've been sinning. Why did this bad thing happen? The Lord did it to you. The Lord did it to you or he allowed it to happen. Either way, him allowing it to happen is still just a fancy way of him saying he did it to you. I only do that, say that to y'all because some of y'all get butt, will get butt hurt over the fact that he did some pretty cool, pretty cold stuff to y'all. So it'll just be like he allowed it to happen. That makes you feel better, right? But he did it to you, right? Because you sinned. You have to pay for your sins, right? This is the concept you need to understand. Why are you sick? You might be sick because you sinned. You know what I'm talking about? You might be, why am I going through this? Why am I going through this situation of financial difficulty right now? It might be because you sinned, right? Why am I depressed and having all these mental health days? It might be because you sinned, just like uh, just like Saul, remember? And the Lord sent the evil spirit to depress him. Remember, to give him mental health issues. The Lord sent that evil spirit on him because he has sinned. Will there be evil in the city and the Lord have not done it? All right? I create peace and I create evil. I create the light and I create the darkness. All right? That's God. All right. First John chapter 2 and verse, or First John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So now we know here in verse 16 when he says, do not err, my beloved brethren, what he means. He means do not sin. You must keep the law, All right? In verse 17, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, All right? The father of lights is referring to God the father. All right, let's pick it back up here now in verse 18. It says here, of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. All right, so if he begot us of his own will, that means we were predestined, right? All right, so I have here in the notes for verse 18, those who make the first resurrection were slash are predestinated slash chosen by the father okay ephesians chapter 4 and we're going to pick it up at verse 1 all right so when james said of his own will begat he us with the word of truth let's look at that the father predestined us to his love from the beginning all right ephesians chapter 4 now we're going to pick it up at verse one. There, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Notice here, walk worthy of the vocation. Vocation meaning work, your job, wherewith ye were called. He's talking about your job as a Christian. Because you got to work at salvation. It's something you got to work at. You got to strive for. You got to labor to achieve. Okay. All right. He says here, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, fair, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right now. Mm, 
Let me make sure. Yeah? Oh, yeah, that's fine. All right, let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8, and we're going to pick it up at verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28. Is that what I meant? All right, that's what I meant. All right. I was looking at it. I was like, all right, hold on. Do, do, do. That was a typo. It was fine to read it because reading any scripture is fine. But I was like, that's not what I wanted. We're talking about predestination. All right. Let's go to Ephesians 1, and then we'll go to Romans. All right, Ephesians 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I always point this out. Notice here, he doesn't name three, and he doesn't name one. He names two, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Two gods. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice here, the Father chose us from before the foundation of the world. Verse 5 having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. All right, now let's go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to pick it up at verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Notice here, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. All right, now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to pick it up at verse 20. And here, this will explain what James meant when he said that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, right? What does he mean by that? That we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is talking about the first resurrection and making the kingdom when we become spirit beings, right? First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man, also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Notice here in verse 20, it said that Christ became the first fruits of them that slept, right? Now, verse 22, that's why we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. He being the first one and then us coming after him. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Right? When will we be made alive again? At the resurrection. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Right? Talking about at Christ's second advent, his second coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, 
that God may be all in all, right? And that's talking about when the Father's kingdom comes, right? Now, I'm going to pull up the notes. You got a question? All right. We're going to go to do, 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 back to James, and we're going to pick it back up at verse 18. Let me see. I can't see the full part of it, and I don't want to put it up. I don't know I would, I would have to put it up on the screen unless I put Another comment. I'll just put Shalom. And then I will see it from there. Is it possible that some things befall people because of time and chance? Yeah, that's possible too. Yeah. But sometimes it's the Lord just doing this. Sometimes it's just the Lord doing it to you. But also, yeah, sometimes stuff just happens. That's just a part of life. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> sometimes that's the case. But also sometimes the Lord is doing it directly to you. Right. And a lot of times that is the case. People just don't want to people just don't want to deal with that. Right. Because we read that all throughout the Bible. The fact that the children of Israel are under punishment is because of what? The Lord did that to them because they were disobedient. But yeah, some stuff just happens. Some stuff may not um some stuff may not be because you did anything. Right. If you remember David, right? So use that as an example. When David had to beg for bread, right? Even though he's the one who he's the one people love to quote when it talks about in the Psalms about how the righteous, you know. I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. Well, David was righteous, but and we literally can read him begging for bread. So you take people take that scripture and Psalms out of context. But anyways, point I was going to make here is David was going through a lot of oppression and Saul was trying to kill him and and all kinds of stuff was going on. And David hadn't done anything. David was, you know, righteous. Right. So sometimes you could be having stuff happening to you for no fault of your own. Like Job. Job didn't do nothing. That's the biggest. <laughs> that's the biggest example to give. That's the biggest example to give of that. Yeah. So that can happen too, where it's just you know something can some bad stuff can just be happening just because like you didn't do anything, right? But get this with Job, who did it to him? God did it, even though he didn't do anything. Satan still had to get permission. So that's why we always, even if it's just a happenstance of no fault of your own, the Lord still allowed it to happen. Yeah. So anyways, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Those of us who are going to make the first resurrection, we were predestinated to do so. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Right, so I have here in verse 19, as the young people say, say less, which I don't like that saying, but remember the first time we heard that? I thought it was disrespectful. I was like, what? We saying say less. Like, what? You telling me to shut up? Like, you know, anyways, I digress. All right, so he says here, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, right? You want to be a more of a listener instead of more of a talker. You want to be more of a listener. Verse 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, all right? So he says here, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You should avoid anger, right? Avoid anger, all right? Verse 21, if at all possible, there's righteous anger. And sometimes, you, you know, Jesus got mad in the temple and overthrew the tables and all that. You can have a righteous anger, but you should try to avoid anger at all costs, if at all possible, all right? Verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and super, super, super fluidity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. I'm going to read that again. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness 
and receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your souls. When it says engrafted, you need to have the word of God engrafted into you, engrafted into your soul, into your body. That means the word of God should be living inside of you. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So James is telling them, you need to do the word. You need to, and the word he's talking about here is the law, the commandments, right? You need to be doers of the commandments, not only hearers, okay? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, right? Verse 24, for, be, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner and, and forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. All right. So notice here in verses 21 through 25, living by God's word is the only way to get salvation. You have to be a doer of his word. That means you have to do it. You have to do what he says, right? You can't just say it with your mouth. You have to actually do it, right? And it says here, a doer of his word. His word is the Bible. So you have to do the things that are in this Bible. That's why we do New Moon, because we read it in this Bible. Therefore, we do it because we are doers of the word. It's all that simple, literally that simple, okay? So I have here in the notes, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread alone. Right? So man doesn't live by bread only. What does man live by? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Right? So you don't live off just food. You're supposed to live off of God's word. That's how you become a doer of his word, right? When it said here, engrafted word, the engrafted word, that means the Bible must live inside you, in your mind. It must be inside you and grafted into you, engrafted into your mind, right? That means all your thoughts should have the word of God and grafted into them. That means every thought of your mind should go through the funnel of the Bible, right? Before it comes out, before it comes out of your mouth, before you do whatever action you're gonna do, you need to put that thought through the funnel of the Bible, which should be engrafted into your mind. Meaning, can I do this? Let's see what the Bible says. Bible says no, so I'm not doing it. You get what I'm saying? I'm going to open my mouth and blah, 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 blah. Nah, let me run this through the funnel. Bible says I should keep my mouth closed. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceive if his own heart, this man's religion is vain, All right? So if you have a problem controlling your tongue, but if you, and you think you're religious, you're not religious, All right? A religious person is going to, and a, being religious is not a bad thing, All right? We got to stop letting people take terms and pervert them. And then now we don't use the term anymore, All right? Religious is a good thing, All right? It's in the Bible, All right? He says here, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. All right? You have to watch your mouth. That's what bridle your tongue is. You got to bridle your tongue. All right? Put a lock on it. Verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. All right? Now, Let's go into chapter two, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. All right. So I have here in verse one, the, pre the precept, do not hold your faith with an attitude of personal favoritism. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Do not hold your faith with an attitude of personal favoritism. And what he's dealing with here in verses one through 13 is we are not supposed to show favoritism to the wealthy over the poor, right? You're not supposed to show favoritism to the wealthy over the poor, okay? And, we, and really, you shouldn't show favoritism with no one. You should be equal in all your ways, right? But you definitely don't want to show favoritism to the wealthy over the poor. 
For if there come unto your assembly, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, when he says here your assembly, he's talking about to church. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, right? So if you treat the wealthy person nicer and disrespect the poor person, you know what I'm talking about? And this stuff happens in churches. You'd be surprised. It, I'm not going to give examples, but it can, it can, it can happen. It, 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 not, it can happen. It does happen. All right. So he paints a picture here. You have two visitors coming into the church, one dressed in fine clothes, the other one dressed in dirty clothes. And he's telling you here, you should not show favoritism, right? to the one who's in the nicer clothes. Verse four, are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts, right? So I have here in verse four, this is a violation of Torah or the law, therefore a sin. Right, I'm gonna read verse four again. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? The Torah commands us to be unpartial, right? Impartial. We should be equal in all our ways. So if you're showing partiality, you just violated Torah. This is why he's telling them that. All right. Let's pick it back up here at verse five. Hearken, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he have promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme. The equivalent of them drawing you before the judgment seat today would be like garnishing your wages. All right, they wealthy. The government or whatever business it is doing that, they wealthy. They garnishing your wages, right? Now you being oppressed, okay? The wealthy are, the super wealthy are the ones who oppress you, right? Even when this pandemic stuff was going on, right? Wasn't it the wealthy elite? They kept doing what they wanted to do. Remember when we were all locked down and couldn't do nothing, right? But the wealthy elite, they were throwing parties and all kinds of stuff, doing whatever they wanted to do. And they were the ones who helped orchestrate the pandemic, right? Anyways, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse seven. Do, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called, right? So I have here in the notes for verses five through seven, James is letting you know the rich oppress the poor. All right, let's pick it back up here at verse eight. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well, right? So he says here, he mentions the royal law. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. What does he mean here, okay? The 10 commandments, the book of the covenant, AKA the Torah, that's what the royal law is, okay? I have here, see Romans 13 and verse nine for verse eight. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, right? So that's that's from the 10 commandments, right? But he can't, name, and there's more than just 10 commandments. There's hundreds. He can't name all hundred and all the hundreds. And he's not from the name all 10. So he sums it up here. He names a few of them. And then what does he say? And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. He's like, so rather than name all the other commandments, we can sum them up this way. How? Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All right. So here in James chapter two and verse eight, when he says, if ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, he's talking about the commandments that includes Sabbath. That includes the dietary law, the feast days. That includes all of God's commandments, okay? All of them. The only ones that Christ nailed to the cross was the sacrificial law and the Levitical priesthood. So that means we don't sacrifice animals anymore and we don't have a Levitical priesthood. That's it. Other than that, everything else you got to do. You got to keep, okay? He says here, letting you know what the royal law is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Right. That's why Paul lets you know in Romans, that's just keeping the commandments. Right. Just like it's going to tell you here in first John chapter five and verse two. 
By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, right? So we love God and we love our neighbor, how? When we keep God's commandments. So if you want to love your neighbor, keep the royal law, what do you have to do? Keep all of God's commandments, verse nine, right? But if ye, but if ye have respect of persons, which means now you're in, which means now you're partial, right? But if ye have respect to person, persons, ye commit sin, you violated Torah, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Notice how much here we're talking about the law. This is why they don't want to read James. Okay. So notice here, let's read it again. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Again, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law, okay? Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. This is letting you know you have to keep the whole law. You can't pick and choose. If you mess up in one, you're guilty in all of them, Right? All right, it's all that simple. You have to keep all his laws. And remember, transgression of the law, our sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. That's an automatic death sentence from Elohim, all right? So I have here in the notes for verse 10, you must keep all of Yahweh's laws, judgment, statutes, and commandments to escape eternal damnation, all right? Verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if, thou commit, uh, now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. All right, what does he mean here when he says, speak ye, and, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty? All right, the law of liberty here means the royal law without our freedom from the sacrificial law slash Levitical priesthood. That's the liberty. That's the freedom. The law of liberty, you've been freed from what? You've been freed from the sacrificial law and the Levitical priesthood, but you still got to keep the law. You understand? The law of liberty, right? What have you been freed from? So the law of liberty is referring to the royal law, right? Without our freedom from, because liberty, the sacrificial law and the Levitical priesthood. That's all the law of liberty is referring to. All right, now let's go to Exodus chapter 23 and we're going to pick it up at verse 3. Exodus chapter 23 and we're going to pick it up at verse 3. And showing here, this is what James meant when he said, if you have respect to persons, and especially in regards to rich and poor, right? Rich and poor people. Right, that you've transgressed, you've committed a sin, right? You've broken the law. Let's go into Torah and find out what James is talking about. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 3. Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. Skip down now to verse 6. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. All right, so this is saying you should not be partial to the rich and you shouldn't be partial to the poor. You need to have respect of no persons. You should treat everybody the same, right? James said this, are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts, right? In James chapter two and verse four. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter one now and we're gonna pick it up at verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter one and we're gonna pick it up at verse 16. Ye have respect of persons, ye should not do that. Why? Because Torah says don't do that. This is why James and them told the, the Gentiles and, and the early church, even some of the uh, even with having to deal with some of the Hebrews in the early church and the Jews in the early church too. If they weren't brought up in an understanding of Torah, they gotta be taught everything from the beginning too. Right. So they started off with basics, then go into deeper stuff. So notice here in this epistle with James, now he's going into Torah, breaking down to them about respect of persons. OK. Anyways, I digress. Let's pick it up here at verse 16. 
And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment. Right? What does it say here in Torah? Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall hear the poor as well as the rich. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And also here he says, you for the person who's going to judge, you should not be afraid of the person you're dealing with because the judgment is from God, right? That's why even too, when I have to do spiritual counseling, I just tell you what it is because I got to tell you what does say of the Lord. I can't fear you and fear your response, even though half the time people get mad because they don't want to hear what the Lord has to say, right? Because it's usually something they don't want to do. All right, let's pick it back up here. It says, for the judgment is God's and the cause that is and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it on to me and I will hear it, all right? But the key here is in verse 17, he said, ye shall not respect persons in judgment, okay? James said in verse nine of chapter two, but if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. So we just went into Torah, right? Deuteronomy is in Torah. And we just read how it is a sin, right? Ye, didn't we? It just said here, ye shall not respect persons in judgment. This ain't a law that was added because of transgression. Is this a law that was added because of transgression? This ain't one of those, right? You're supposed to treat everybody fair. That's what this is saying. So we went into Torah and read it, okay? Everything James is referring to is in Torah. Like we can go into Torah and show it to you. That's what we're going to do. But if ye have respect to persons, ye have committed sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Okay. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Just show you what this law of liberty. What does he mean by we are in the law of liberty? The law of liberty means you keep the royal law, but you are free, are liberated from sacrificing animals. That's all it means. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and, hip and hypocrisies and envies and and I'm going to start this over. Wherefore, laying aside all malice. So as Christians, we need to put this stuff away out of our lives. This is leaven that needs to be purged out. Malice and all guile. You want to get rid of hatred towards people. And hypocrisies. You don't want to be a hypocrite. Envies. You don't want to envy people and covet after stuff. And all evil speakings. Don't have an evil mouth and speak evil things with your mouth. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Notice here in the new covenant, we are the temple, the sacrifice, the altar, okay? That's what you've been freed from with the law of liberty. I have here in the notes, in the new covenant, we are the priesthood, temple, altar, and living sacrifices with Christ serving as our high priest, okay? Let's pick it back up here now at verse six, okay? Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Notice here again, chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A peculiar people, and remember, Peter's audience was to the children of Israel too, just like James's audience. Yeah, 
he says and you can read in Torah where he tells the children of Israel that they are a kingdom of priests. That's what their job was. Unfortunately, Jesus fired us. That ye should show forth praises of him. Like this is one of them cases where you can say, you know how they say you're not, you know, like the, the Gentiles or the church didn't replace the Jews. You know how that's not, they didn't do that. Well, this is actually a case where you did get replaced. Because the priests and the people really out there doing doing this is going to be the spiritual Israel, the ones that are Jews inwardly, the ones who are Christians who are actually fearing God and keeping the commandments, right? Because most of the actual physical children of Israel are not following Christ, right? Anyways, I digress. And this work's got to be done, right? Got to spread this gospel. Somebody's got to do it. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice the disobedient people in verse 8, you know, sinners. It says they were appointed too. Like, you know how we were chosen and predestined? Them disobedient were appointed too. All right, verse 10. Which in time past, and all that means is Elohim created a simulated reality. He knows the end from the beginning. You don't know the end from the beginning, but he does. So you have free will, but he already knows what you're going to do. It's all that simple. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conversation having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now imagine this from my kinsmen in the flesh. You wouldn't have to have Black Lives Matter if you just did, right? Isn't that what it just said here? Verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, right? If you, for the children of Israel, dispersed amongst the Gentiles, if you just did right, you know what I'm talking about? Fear God and keep the commandments. Stop committing crime. Stop fornicating. Stop having children out of wedlock. You understand what I'm saying? Stop blasting your loud music at the gas station. You got shot. That was wrong. But at the same time, you weren't a good neighbor because not everyone wants to hear your loud thumpity thump. You understand what I'm saying? All right? It's literally all that. It's literally all that simple. So he says here, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, because even notice back then, what were the Gentiles saying about the brothers? <laughs> Y'all evildoers. So you know what I'm talking about? Y'all evil. You commit crimes and do evil stuff. That's the same thing the Gentiles was saying in the New Testament. Same thing the Gentiles say today about the true children of Israel. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, right? So instead of them speaking evil of you, they'll speak good of you because you do good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And because we being the people of the book, if we do good works, then the Gentiles would see that and would glorify God. And then the Gentiles might not do so much Sunday stuff, right? Because we the, we the real people. That's why he dispersed us everywhere. And there's a minority of us everywhere. And there's some countries in the world where we're not the majority, we're not the minority, we're a majority. But a lot of places we've been scattered to, we're a significant minority. What was one of the benefits of that in Elohim's eyes, besides it being a punishment for us? That when we wake up, we can teach the nations we're in. You get what I'm saying? People already jack our swag. They like, you know what I'm saying? Don't they jack our swag and stuff? Now imagine if we were doing good stuff, you know they're gonna jack that, right? Because they already jack the semi-decent stuff we do and toss out the bad. I digress. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Notice here, he got to tell these Negroes, what? Obey the government, Negro. You're going to have to do that in the land. Peter's audience is the same as James. We covered this in the beginning. In verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, talking about the children of Israel, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatians, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. They're strangers because they're in Turkey. They're supposed to be in Israel, but they got scattered there in captivity, right? I'm just trying to make this plain. 
There's a reason why Peter is saying this. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the law for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well, right? Again, that's why if your eight-year-old son wasn't stealing Doritos, you know, that doesn't seem like somebody hungry to me. You get in junk food. And if you wasn't stealing a big old bag of Doritos, the police wanted to pick them up, right? And brought them back. Why did the police pick up your eight-year-old son for stealing? Because he stole, right? And that's the punishment for doing an evil called stealing, which is also a sin, okay? It's all that simple, okay? And for the praise of them that do well, if you don't argue with the officer, you know what I'm talking about? If you don't tell the officer four times, I'm not going to comply, why do you need my ID? Then you might not get tased, right? But after the fourth time, if you're in Chattanooga and the officer has then told you to let me see your ID or get out of the car and you don't comply, when you get tased on the fourth time, whose fault is that? That's your fault, right? If you would have did what he said, then you can get praise of them that do well, right? And for the praise of them that do well, verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, right? Notice here, you don't like the ignorant racist stuff they say and all that? You want to put that stuff to bed, to silence? Then fear God and keep the commandments and do right, right? Verse 16, that means get married. Remember how he told us in Jeremiah? You know what that means, children of Israel? That means you get married, get you a wife, have kids, raise your family, have a nuclear family, fear God and keep the commandments, tell your kids to go to school and get an education, right? Instead of our culture being uh, revolved around trap music and sports, you know, I'm talking about in crime and gang banging and that, that kind of stuff, right? Verse 17, you know what I'm talking about. Verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Notice here he says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. All right, skip down now to verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his footsteps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Notice here, he said, following Christ's footsteps. And then he said, who did no sin. Sin is transgression of the law. We're supposed to follow in Christ's footsteps. Christ didn't break any of God's laws. So that means you should not be breaking any of God's laws. That means you should be keeping Sabbath. That means you should not be fornicating. That means you should not be stealing. That means you should not be lying. That means you should not be eating pork. That means you should not be eating shrimp, right? No, even Pastor Pork Chop is going to tell you that Jesus didn't eat pork. He's not going to get up unless he that. I don't, hopefully he ain't that crazy. They get up there and blaspheme. Yeah, Jesus ate whatever he wanted. No, he didn't. He know that. So then you got to ask yourself, why are you teaching me then it's okay for me to eat pork when Jesus didn't eat pork? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but mo like I'm still thinking of there I know there would be some that would do that, but still like a lot of them when you go and if you go talk to them, you know, like counseling behind closed doors yeah. and they're not in the pulpit, they'll be like, of course Jesus didn't eat pork. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Anyways, I di I, I digress. Let's pick it back up here at verse 23. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. All right. Notice here it says, when Jesus was reviled, when he was threatened, he did not respond back. Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. All right. And this is that law of liberty. We've been freed from the sacrifices, because Christ was a sacrifice for us. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 
It says, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And I'm not breaking this down thoroughly because we covered this last week and in, and in a Torah school a little bit this morning, right? So y'all should be up to speed, up to snuff on this. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people, the Holy Ghost, thus, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks. And let me point this out too. The other reason why with the law of liberty, he says walk as one after, uh, as one after the law of liberty, that's total righteousness because you've been freed from the sacrifices. There is no more sacrifice. Remember, Christ did his sacrifice once and for all. He ain't getting sacrificed again. So the law of liberty means I'm just going to keep the commandments and not sin. Therefore, I don't need a sacrifice, but I've been freed from that. Anyways, I, I digress. Verse, 11, verse uh, 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse and cardinal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of the reformation All right so i have here in the notes for verse 10 when it says uh the time of reformation imposed All right webster's 1828 to place over by authority or by force right so in here in verse 10 was it verse 10 yeah so in verse 10 when it said imposed on them until the time of reformation right so that means the sacrificial law was put on them till what? Till the time of reformation, till Christ came, right? To die for our sins. That was imposed on them till that time, till the time of reformation, right? Let's pick it back up here at verse 11. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's that law of liberty, to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Those dead works was sacrificing animals. That could never save them. And if they were not sinning in the first place, they wouldn't have had to sacrifice any animals in the old covenant anyway. Right? So I have here in the notes, the sacrificial law is what we have liberty from. It is no longer imposed on us. Right? This is the law added because of transgression of breaking the royal law that came 430 years after Abraham. Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10 and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Notice here it says they would have ceased to be offered, right? Verse three, but in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Verse 7. Because why would you think he's going to take pleasure in that? He Because if you have to do a sacrifice, that means you done sin. Verse 8. No, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, mine, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Notice here, when he says in a new covenant, I will put my law in their heart, right? Notice here, so multiple laws, right? So the law that was done away with that we've just been reading about is what? The sacrificial law. Because in blood of bulls and goats couldn't save you. But you still got to keep the royal law. You know, all them thou shalt and all that stuff. Yeah, right? you still got to keep them junts, chief. That's why Paul said here, people don't be paying attention to what they read. Like literally, they don't be paying attention to what they read. This is in this same chapter now. Now he's telling you there's laws you must keep. He says, I will put my laws into their hearts, mine. And in their minds will I write them. That's the same thing James meant when he said the engrafted word of God. The word of God has to be literally engrafted in your mind. I always go sci-fi. Thinking of sci-fi, you know when they engraft, you like universal soldier and stuff, RoboCop and different things. You know what I'm talking about? And they ask to be engrafted into your mind, literally. You know what I'm talking about. Like they done put the computer in your brain. Like that's how the word of God needs to be. Like the computer put into your brain. All right now we're remission, verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. But like once your sins have been forgiven, you've entered into Christ, you've entered into covenant with Christ. There is no more remission for sins. He's not gonna he's not gonna sacrifice himself again. He did that one time. You are supposed to go forward living your life to the best of your ability, fearing God and keeping the commandments. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he have consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Excuse me, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Galatians 3 and verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before, who, before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? When he's saying here, have ye now been made perfect by the flesh? That's He's talking about literally by the sacrifices of animals. Okay, And this is what he's talking about when he says the works of the law. We just read where Paul told you in Hebrews what works of the law can't save you, right? We literally just read that. Sacrificing animals, that can't save you, okay? So that's the works of the law he's talking about. Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, 
doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And James is going to talk about this too in the book of James about how your faith without works is dead, right? So notice here, it says, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many, for as, many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you don't keep God's law, you are going to be cursed, right? This is self-explanatory. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. What does this mean? Okay, what this means is the works of the law is a sacrificial law, right? And the curse is what? Sin. If you So if you sin, you are going to have to keep doing those works of the law, making animal sacrifices. Okay, this is all Paul is talking about here. Okay, verse 9. So then when they, so then when, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in, in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now remember, we just read in Hebrews what law it is that can't justify you. It was uh, the blood of bulls and goats, right? And of calves. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuleth it or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Notice here, Paul tells the Galatians, the covenant made with Abraham cannot be changed, cannot be added to, cannot be taken away from, right? Circumcision was a part of that covenant, okay? So circumcision could not be taken off the table. Verse 17, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Why does Paul say here the law that came 430 years later? Because 430 years after Abraham, this is when the children of Israel come up out of Egypt in the Exodus. And this is when they get the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial law. But remember, even when the children of Israel first come up out of Egypt, he did not tell them about sacrifices at first, right? He told them to just be obedient, obey me. Once he started seeing y'all not going to obey me, that's when the sacrificial law got put on the table, right? Now, and when I say, I won't say put on the table, that's when the sacrificial law got codified, All right? Anyways, let's pick it back up here at verse uh, 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, and the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up onto the faith which, which should afterwards be revealed. Notice here, we were kept, un, kept under the law till when? What did Paul say in Hebrews? Till the time of reformation. This was imposed upon us until the time of reformation. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us onto Christ that we might be justified by faith. All right, so I have here in the notes, the law of liberty is to live as prophets. 
typos, 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 typos. Oh, and I can't put that extra S in here. So I'll just say it. All right. The law of liberty, the law of liberty is to live like the prophets and our father of our faith, Abraham. So you want to live. That's what the law of liberty is, to live like the prophets and the father, Abraham. He kept the royal law, right? Yahweh's laws, judgments, statutes, and commandments free from or at liberty from the works of the sacrificial law. Because remember, Abraham and them, they only did sacrifices on occasion because they weren't sinning like that. Okay? All right. The sacrificial law slash Levitical priesthood, along with the tabernacle of congregation, was given 430 years after Abraham in Exodus chapter 25 through 31 in the book of Leviticus. All right. Paul is referencing the works of the law of animal sacrifice. James is referencing the works of righteousness, which is keeping the commandments. So when you hear when James is talking about works, he's not talking about the works of the law that Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about in the wrong mouth. Paul is talking about the those dead works from the sacrificial law. James is talking about the works of righteousness. Okay, so and the works of righteousness is what keeping the commandments. Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy six. And verse 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us, right? So what's righteousness again, according to the Bible? Keeping all of his commandments. Let's read it again. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments, not some, not a few. Not pick and choose all his commandments, okay? This is why you have to do line upon line upon line and precept upon precept to get full understanding of stuff. All right, let's go to Genesis 26, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 26, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 26 and 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went on to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, on to Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. Notice here, Isaac needed advice. He needed wisdom. And the Lord is giving him wisdom liberally, right? He's telling him exactly what he should do. Don't move to Egypt. Stay where you are. You know, some people want to know, should I move? All right. Pray and wait and hear from the Lord. The Lord will tell you if he wants you to move or not. All right. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham, thy father. And I will take thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because that Abraham, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So it says here he kept his charge, his judgments. He kept his commandments, his statutes, and his laws. Paul just told you what law was done away with. The law that came 430 years after Abraham. So obviously that law that came 430 years after Abraham can't have nothing to do with Elohim's laws, judgments, statutes, and commandments. Because Abraham kept his laws, judgments, statutes, and commandments. Right? Now, let's go back to James chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 14. James chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 14. I hope this is making simple enough sense to everybody okay and i have here i have here for james uh verses 14 through 26 all right the main point to get out of this confess your faith by how you live not just by what you say all right so you confess your faith or you show people your faith right by how you live not the words out of your mouth it's not about how much you say you love jesus it's about your actions all right what you do shows whether or not you love jesus all right, let's pick it up here at verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food 
and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? So he says here, if someone is in need and you don't, and you have the ability to help them and you don't help them, what profit did that? Right? That didn't profit them. You didn't help them. They still cold. They still hungry. And it didn't profit you because you didn't do the good works. You know, charity, which is a commandment, right? Anyways, I digress. Verse 19, thou believest, I mean, verse 18, yea, a man say that thou hast faith. No, we didn't read 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So if all you have is faith and you don't have works, and remember, works with James is what? Righteousness. The works with James, he's not talking about the works, the dead works of the law. He's not talking about the sacrificial law. He's talking about works of righteousness, which is keeping the commandments, just like Abraham did. Abraham had faith and he had works, right? All right. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works, right? So I have here in the notes for verse 18, a confession of faith is not necessarily proof of genuine faith. Just because you say you believe with your mouth, right? That's not necessarily proof that you really believe. Proof that you really believe is through your actions. It's just like with a, a husband and a spouse. Don't you say something, if you love me, prove it. Show me with your actions. I don't want to just hear with your words. With your actions, you done cheated on me. You done got a wandering eye. That's what your actions are, but you say you love me. Show me you love me with your actions, all right? Let's pick it up here at verse 19. Verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So James here is like, so what you believe in God? Yeah, the demons believe in God. Satan believes in God. Big whoop, right? Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Right? So I have here in the notes for verses 19 through 20, a confession of orthodoxy is not necessarily proof of genuine faith. Right? So just because you claim you believe, Right. And just because you say, oh, I go to church, I believe. Right. And you can quote a couple of scriptures. Right. Satan quoted scriptures to Jesus. Remember when he was tempting him? That don't mean nothing. It's your actions, your actions. OK, that determined. That's the proof. OK. Also, you'll notice here, even the demons have some measure of orthodoxy. They understand some stuff with the scriptures. Right. Because they believe. OK, let's pick it back up here now at verse Let's pick it back up here now at verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead, okay? Do you recognize that faith without works is useless, okay? I hope y'all get that. Faith without works is useless. So you saying you believe in Christ, but you don't have no good works is pointless. You're not going to make the kingdom, okay? Let's pick it back up here now at verse 21 verse 21 was not abraham our father justified by works when he offered isaac his son upon the altar seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith abraham believed god and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of god that was christ declaring the end from the beginning because Abraham hadn't fulfilled his righteousness yet. Remember, Abraham was still waffling. He still, he still had doubts. He laughed in the face of God, right? He lied a couple times, right? So that's why he had to be tested with Isaac, All right? Let's see if you're going to give up the one thing you waited so long for, right? Let's see if you're willing to do that. And you know what Abraham did? I'm going to do what the Lord said, because I know he's not going to allow this to happen. I know his word, but he's telling me to do it, so that's what I'm going to do right? Blind faith, but also blind obedience, okay? Anyways, I digress. So even with Abraham, you have to have faith and works, even with Abraham, okay? It says here in verse 22, seeing thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled. I'm going to pick it up at 21. 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So just like if you stop breathing and you don't have any more air in your lungs, you dead, right? If you have faith and you don't have works, your faith is dead, okay? So you will be judged by your works. Any pastor telling you otherwise is lying, right? And any church telling you otherwise is lying. You know, if they claim they believe in the Bible, they lying. All right, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. All right, so always constantly trying to find some new thing, always constantly, you know, trying to learn some new thing that can become a weariness of flesh. And at the end of the day, the most important what Solomon is really trying to tell y'all, the most important book you should be focusing on is this. All right, while you spending so much time reading all these other books, you know, you should be spending more time reading God's word. All right, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, right? When Solomon says here the conclusion of the whole matter, what matter? The point to life. Because remember, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon wanted to determine what is the point to life? Why are we here, right? So he says here, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, right? So what's your purpose in life? Fear God and keep the commandments. Why? Why do you need to fear God and keep the commandments? Verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, right? So you will be judged by your works, right? Whether or not you kept the commandments, that is how you're going to be judged. You have a question? All right, let's go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the righteous, the saints, the ones who fear God and keep the commandments, the ones who have good works, they're going to make the first resurrection and reign with Christ a thousand years. The saints don't have to participate in judgment day. You understand what I'm saying? The only, the saints participation in judgment day is them helping Christ judge other people. That's how you, that's what the, that's what the saints will be doing. If you make the first resurrection, you don't have to go up before the judgment seat on judgment day and be judged. You were already judged. That's why you made the first resurrection. Okay. Everybody else, remember how we just read in Ecclesiastes, even every secret thing. This is why I want no parts of that line. There, We all got skeletons in our closet. There's stuff no one knows that you've done. Only you know, right? And you don't, and on judgment day, you're going to be in that long judgment line and everybody's works is going to be up on the big screen for everyone to see. You know what I'm talking about? It's going to be Latasha, come on down. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's not going to be fun. And then they're going to put your life on the big screen. And every secret thing will be revealed, okay? I'm not trying to have that. So I'm going to try to make this first resurrection. 
verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Skip down to verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. All right, what books is John talking about are open? The Bible. So all the books of the Bible are open, right? And then another book is open. So it says here, and the books were open. That's the Bible. And another book was open, which is the book of life. So the book of life in the Bible is going to be set before the judgment seat, right? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So how were they judged? They were judged according to what was written in what? The books of the Bible, and how are they judged? According to their works. You feel me? So what's going to happen on Judgment Day? You're going to be in line. He's going to look into the book of life and see that your name is not there, right? Ah, you're not there. You're not in the book of life. Time to judge your works, right? And they gonna, and he's going to go to the master, you know, the, the master computer file or whatever their supercomputer they got and pull your jump drive out. You know how when you when you died, all your consciousness and all your memories, everything you did, even stuff that you can't remember anymore, they got all that on file. And they've been videotaping you. The seven eyes have been going through and fro, right? Recording everything. And these things got eyes all over their body. And that's just the seven. There's angels everywhere. And they got eyes all over their body. They done been seeing everything. Just like Babylon can see everything with their satellites, right? They got that capability too. They can even penetrate into your walls and stuff too and see stuff. But anyways, just like how they have that capability, right? But they can't fully use it to its full capability, right? God has that capability and he can use it to his full capability. So all your works are going to be brought up again and they're going to be judged according to the Bible. Did you do what the Bible said? So Jesus is going to be like, oh, I see you went to church. But, oh, man, you went to church on Sunday. Shucks. I never commanded for you to go to church on Sunday. Let's see when I commanded you to go to church. Then he's going to open up the Bible, these books. And you know all the books I go through and show you where you need to keep Sabbath in the Torah, in Isaiah, in the Gospels, in the Book of Acts and all that? Jesus is going to do the same thing on Judgment Day. And he's going to be like, bruh, I never told you to go to church on Sunday. I told you to go to church on the Sabbath. If you wanted to go to church on Sunday, that's fine, but you better make sure you went to church on the Sabbath and you did it. All right, you've been found guilty. Do you understand? And remember, if you're guilty in one, you're guilty in all. But we know most of these humanoids are going to be guilty in hundreds of things. But you get what I'm saying? If you're guilty in one, we read that earlier, you're guilty in all. Okay? It's all that simple. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the set, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Right? How were they judged? According to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? I have here in the notes, one of the works you will be judged for is your speech. So you want to guard your tongue. All right, let's go to James chapter three, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. Jesus is going to be like, oh, shucks, you were eating pork, weren't you? And shrimp and catfish. All right, let's open up these books and see what it says about that. Op, it says you weren't supposed to eat that. Sister Amber, do you mind tossing him in the lake of fire for me? And then that's when you'll have to be like, my pleasure. Don't worry. All right, let's go to James chapter three. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. All right? So when he says here, be not many masters, okay? Knowing that we shall receive the greater commendation, condemnation, right? You, He's basically warning. Some of y'all shouldn't seek to be in leadership roles. And some of y'all shouldn't seek to want to be the preacher or be the pastor or be the teacher. 
because with that comes greater condemnation with much responsibility you know what i'm talking about to whom much is given much is required so be careful with that for in many things we offend all if any man offend not in word the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body notice here and he because he says you know, even the pastor, even the teacher, he's not going to be perfect. Everyone offends. At some point, you're going to sin, right? You're going to have a slip up. He says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, right? And if you don't have any offense, then you're a perfect man, right? And only Christ was the only one who was perfect. And also, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. All right, so even think about us when we drive our cars. The steering wheel turns that big old vehicle. It's one little steering wheel. That's how your tongue, that's what he's referring to your tongue as. Your tongue has more power than you realize. All right, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire. Wars have been started over the tongue, over stuff people were saying, right? Fights have started over the tongue. Divorces have started over people's tongues. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil of deadly poison. There, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. Notice there he says, with the same mouth that you bless God with, you turn around and curse man. With that same mouth it's not supposed to be the same way i use myself as an example i have to check myself with this with driving because people in memphis can't drive and it's memphis has a bad reputation with driving and we talked about it before and just leave it at that and so i have to check my i'm not going to go into it i have to check myself sometimes when i'm on the road because these people almost kill me every time i get on the road i have almost at least one incident daily where my life is almost taken in jeopardy and thank god i got them angels around me to protect me but sometimes once I once you, you know, you almost just killed me, I want to call you a Maryland farmer and not a Maryland farmer and not a Maryland farmer. So sometimes I got to catch myself. Right. I digress. So he says here, it, it says here in verse. Um, in verse eight, we have verse eight, no verse 11. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? That, and it, that can't be, right? A fountain is not going to give you sweet water and bitter water. It's either going to be sweet water or else it's going to be bitter, bad water, right? You can't have both. 12. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 34, and let's break this down some more. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, and we'll pick it up at verse 34. You want to guard your tongue. How can you say, how can you say you have the spirit of Christ in you, but then curse your fellow man? And I know this, well, I won't say I know. Everyone has their own ones that are difficult for them. Pastor will admit this is one of the ones difficult for him. Because I actually don't like muggles and I actually don't like humanoids and they get on my nerves. And so oftentimes I'd be like, I want to just like, ah, and I have to catch myself because I can't do that. All right. Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to pick it up at verse 34. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. All right, so if you're constant, and that's why I work on that, because I, I do have the spirit of Christ in me and the word of God and graft it on my mind, right? So that's why I'm constantly checking myself, checking myself in those situations to make sure I'm not cursing my fellow man just because I got upset, right? But someone who doesn't have the spirit of Christ, who doesn't have the word of God in them, they're not going to have that check. So instead of it being Maryland Farmer, 
it's going to be a whole lot of other stuff. You know what I'm talking about? All right. Out of the abundance of the heart or the mind, the mouth speaketh. So if you said it, that's really inside of you, right? That's why they say loose lips sink ships. And that's why a lot of times when people, you know, that's a, this is another one too. The younger people may not know this. When, don't ever believe don't ever believe this lie from someone oh i was drunk i didn't really mean that nah if they were drunk and they said it then they really 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 meant that right that means they really meant that that's inside them and it only came out because they were drunk all right that means that's deep inside of them and that means that they meant that you know how people get drunk and then they say racist stuff and do other and that means you just racist you know, it came out of you because it's in there. All right, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account therefore in the day of judgment. So notice here, excuse me, this is Jesus, James' brother. Right. And he's saying the same thing James was telling you, you got to guard your tongue, watch your mouth. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak. So you even idle word, you know, how you say stuff playing around. That's why me and Amber check ourselves when, you know, if she'll be like, I'm dead serious. I'd be like, don't say that. If I say it, sometimes I'll say, it, man, I'm dead serious. Don't say that. Are you dead? And are you serious about being dead? No, that was a you get what I'm saying. Watch what watch the words that come out of your mouth, you know. You just be saying anything idly. You know, if that was me, ooh, you know what I would do? Do, to do, to do, to do. Are you really going to do that? Yeah. Don't watch the words that come out of your mouth. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. So you know how you're going to be judged by your works? One of the works you're going to be judged for is your speech. And you're going to have to give an account for every word that you spoke. That's another reason I don't want to be in that line on Judgment Day. That's going to be a long line. You want to talk about eternity. That might be eternity. Us just getting through judging all these people and all their works. All right, verse 37. You're going to have to give an account for every word that you spoke. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. All right, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, right? So again, you are commanded, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, okay? Proverbs 21 and 23. Whosoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles, right? What does it say here? Whosoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue Keep if his soul from troubles. And what's the ultimate trouble you want to keep your soul from? The lake of fire, right? Isn't that the ultimate one? Is there a question? All right. Leviticus 19 and verse 16. Because again, everything, Jane, what's the matter? Uh, did I miss a part? Oh, okay. Let me know if I did, because I don't. That's very much possible. Um. All right, Leviticus 19 and verse 16. Because remember, everything James is referring to, we can go back into Torah and find, right? Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. A talebearer is somebody who talks too much. You're just going around talking too much. Loose lips sink ships. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. All right, now let's go back to James chapter 3. And we're going to pick it back up at verse 13. James chapter 3 and verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out a good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, right? So don't lie against the truth acting like you holy and you righteous, but you dealing with envying and strife, right? Envying is a sin. Don't envy others. Don't covet, right? Don't envy. You know one of the best, you know why I don't envy people? I'm gonna be honest. I don't have a problem envying people because I don't like humanoids and I don't like muggles. I don't care enough to envy you. I, I'm not, that's not a boast. This is fact. I've been a weird one since I was a little kid. My parents can attest to this. Weird. I was a weird little kid, all right? Just weird. 
always been that way. I don't care about what other humans got. That means nothing to me, right? That should be your mentality too. You're not supposed to envy others or covet what other people have. All right, now let's, uh, you know, I know why I was weird. Because even not being in the full truth as a child, my parents made me, you have been over this, how they taught us to believe the Bible, everything it says. Even if that's not what we were actually doing, they still taught us that. So I knew from a very young age, like, thou shalt not covet and envying is bad. And the word of God was just in me. So I've always hated that stuff. I've always hated things that are sinful and that are not righteous. Uh, that doesn't mean that I was perfect because I was not perfect. I went through my sinning stage, right? So, and I had, I know a lot of brothers can relate to this. I had my chief, my chief fornicating stage from like age 18 to like age 22. A chief fornicator. Don't care where it comes from. Just why? Wow. <laughs> it is what it is. People have, you have to use yourself as an example sometimes for people to learn, to learn from so that they don't make the same mistakes. All right, verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. All right, notice here, strife, strife, envying, right? That doesn't come from above, right? That's from the earth. That's devilish, right? So you don't want to have envying and you don't want to have strife. Even in marriages and in family, you don't want strife, all right? We always talk about husband and wife, but even in the household in general. You know how in Torah school, we talk about a man as the high priest? Like, or the man is the priest of the household, right? With Christ being the high priest. That's how it was in patriarchal times. And that's how it is now. You as head of your household, you should be looking for, looking to eliminate strife everywhere in your household, right? Not just with, and same thing with the wife. You don't want strife. You look at your kids, your siblings should not be fighting each other. You feel me? I think it's a good thing like that. I, I think it's a good thing. And I wish I had that type of relationship where, you know, adults who adult siblings who can roommate and like or and can live with each other and you adult siblings and you of the opposite sex you know because remember my niece and nephew did that right that's a good thing right you want to raise your kid you want to raise your siblings up where they don't have strife with each other so even when you see them as little kids and you see them fighting you want to stop them from fighting be like nah man y'all not supposed to fight each other y'all supposed to be on the same team if anything y'all should be fighting other people together you don't fight each other no strife, right? So you want to make sure you remove all strife out of your household, right? Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So that right there off the rip should tell you to avoid envying, right? Avoid envying and strife because he says where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So where there is envy and strife, confusion in every evil work. Do you want evil to come upon you? No, right? Then don't have strife and don't envy. I'm, I'm harping on strife because strife is bad. I use myself, you know, my my parents used to argue a lot when I was growing, growing up. That's strife. That's why I harp on this. I remember, I remember these things, right? Some of y'all remember too as children, when you were a children, when you were a child, if you have both your parents, did you like hearing your parents argue? No, right? Don't kids normally cry and other that's a sign letting you know strife is bad and you setting a bad example for your children. They're gonna grow up and then embrace strife because they saw you with strife. You gotta nip strife in the butt. Strife will destroy a lot of things. I'm gonna harp on it for another 10 seconds. Eliminate strife. Strife will harm a lot of stuff in your life. Do not treat strife as a light thing. If you see yourself having strife, just stop. That's why the Lord says. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Just make your, if it's a new day, forget about what happened and just go about peace. Make yourself be like, you know what? I'm going to be at peace with this person, regardless of what. It's a new day. Let's see if they can piss me off today. That should be your mentality. It's a new day. Are you going to piss me off today? Let's see. If not, you know, we good, but I'm not carrying stuff over to the next day. It's a new day. Do you get what I'm saying? All right. It says here, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So I have in the notes a reference to 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. All right? So God is not the author of confusion. 
So you don't want to deal anything that causes confusion. You know, God is not in it, right? That's another way. You know how you want to know if you're hearing from God. I, that's something I know. If it's confusion, I know God's not in it. I'm like, I'm out. This ain't of God. My wife can attest to this. She's seen me sometimes be like, this is too much, too much stuff going on. We just not doing nothing. We, whatever we were thinking about doing, we not doing it because it's gotten confusing. You know what I'm talking about? You know, another, another sign when there be roadblocks, she's seen me do this. Couple roadblocks pop up. I'm like, man, we not meant to do this. That we were meant to do this. The, these roadblocks want to be popping up. The Lord don't want us doing this. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So look for confusion. If you see confusion in something, you know the Lord is not in that. All right. So I have here bitter jealousy and selfish ambition characterizes worldly demonic wisdom. Right. Jealousy, that's envy. Selfish ambition, right? And strife, that's demonic wisdom and worldly. That's not heavenly, okay? Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. All right, so I have here in the notes, envy and strife are carnal and not spiritual, meaning they are from beneath and not above or heavenly, right? And remember, we're supposed to be heavenly minded or spiritually minded, not carnally minded. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Avoid strife. Strife is contention. First Corinthians chapter three, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you, speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Man, the church at Corinth, they were bad. You know, you know what I'm talking about. They were bad. They his his letters to them is him chastising them mostly. If you look at the other ones, that's not really the case. But Corinthians, he has to go in on the church at Corinth. He says, y'all are babes in Christ. You still on milk and you not spiritual, you carnal. He says, you fleshly. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife. What made them carnal? Envying and strife, right? Just like James said, and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? So James told you envying and strife, that comes from beneath. That's carnal, right? But the wisdom from above is not envious and it's not, and it doesn't have strife. It doesn't show partiality, right? And it's righteousness, okay? It shows mercy. Now, and notice here, again, with strife, sometimes you might have to show mercy. You know how you have disagreements? Sometimes you might be, you might have to just be like, you know what, man? This person was wrong, but I'm going to just let this go for the sake of peace. Just for the sake of peace. All right, now. Let's add this up here. Let's look at do, 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 James chapter 4. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. James chapter 4. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Okay. And I have here, Christians should keep Torah slash the royal law that's the main point of what he's trying to get through here in james chapter 4 verses 1 through 12 from whence come wars and fightings among you come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members All right so he's saying the reason you have strife and divisions is because you are carnal ye lust and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Notice here, James says, some of you are murderers. You've killed people before, right? Remember, he talking to he talking to the Israelites, right? So I have here in the notes, James' audience is Jews slash Hebrews of the children of Israel who are Christians. He is instructing them to keep Torah. In verses one through two. Strife is not becoming of Christians, right? And it is a sin, okay? So strife is not becoming of Christians, and it is a sin. When he says here, the war in your members, right, he means in your flesh, your mind, 
Remember, your real enemy is in between your ears, okay? Your real enemy ain't no one else. Your real enemy is yourself and what goes on in between your own ears and your own brain, right? Think about it. Torah reference here, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, thou shall not kill, right? Because remember here, he just said, some of you kill, right? You're not supposed to do that. Thou shall not kill, all right, let's go to Exodus chapter 21, and we're going to pick it up at verse 12. And we're not going to read all of these. We're going to do a little skipping. But this is just to show you in Torah when he was talking about strife and divisions and how you, this is how you interact with other people, right? The Bible, the Torah gives us specific instructions on how we're supposed to interact with our neighbor and interact with other people. All right, verse 12 of Exodus chapter 21. He that smiteth a man so that he dies shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously on, upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take from him, take him from mine altar that he may die. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Right? So there shouldn't be strife or contention between you and another person between a child and their parent, right? That should not be. Verse 16, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So the child should not be, and this applies even as an adult, you shouldn't be cursing your parents. But in the, you know, like in the, in the home, the parent, the kid might be like, I hate you, mom, F you. I can't stand you, mom. You know what I'm talking about? You know how they be nowadays? You're not supposed to do that. And that's strife too, right? So in Torah here, it commands you not to do that. Okay, He that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And if men strive together, striving together, that's strife. You have beef. Y'all are fighting. You have strife with one another. It says here, and if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not but keep of his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quick. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. All right, and we're going to stop there. But the, you see, even with that, if you have strife with someone, it said in Torah, and you got into a fight with them and you harmed them, when they got better, you were supposed to pay their hospital bill. You were supposed to pay the hospital bill, right, and any loss of wages for that person. This is all telling you, you shouldn't have got into a fight with them in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so no striving with one another, no strife. You're supposed to try to avoid that. All right, let's pick it back up here in James chapter four and verse three. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust, All right? So here in verse three, God will not answer your prayers for carnal things. I repeat. Yah will not answer your prayers for carnal things. Let's read verse three again. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts, right? First John chapter three and verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, right? So if you want God to answer your prayers, you need to do what? Keep the commandments and ask for things that are pleasing in his sight, not carnal things. Carnal things are not going to be pleasing in his sight. All right, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So notice here, he lets you know adulterers and people fornicate, and that's worldly. And we know that to be true. Most worldly people we know who are married cheat. Either both of them do or one of them do, right? That's what worldly people do, right? He says here, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. So if you're going to be friends with the world, that's going to put you at enmity with Elohim, right? That means you and Elohim going to be beefing. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, okay? Okay. So I have here in verse 4, Torah reference, Exodus 20 and 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery, okay? Let's pick it back up here at verse 5. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, 
the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, Be, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Right? So I have here, when it says, submit yourself, therefore, to God, that means keep the commandments, or Torah slash the law. Right? So a Christian, right, in Arabic must also be a true Muslim, because the word Muslim in Arabic means what? Are a practitioner of Islam, one who submits to Eloah or Allah, one who submits to Elohim. Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Right? Just having a play on words here, right? Because in Arabic, that's what it means submission to God. Okay. All right, let's pick it back up here at uh, verse eight. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. All right, so I have here in the notes for verse 8, you must seek Yah first. Stop breaking Jesus' laws, a.k.a. the Torah. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. All right, it's all that simple. So he says here, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Right, you don't want to be double minded. Why? Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Keep your finger here in James. We're coming right back, but let's go to Revelation chapter 3 and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. This is why you don't want to be double minded. Revelation 3 and verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches and unto the angel of the church of the Laodosians. Right, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus don't like a double-minded man. That's a lukewarm person, right? Because you can't make up your mind. You're double-minded. You're neither hot nor cold. You got to make a decision. Remember? This day, who will we serve, right? Who am I going to serve? We're going to serve, as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, right? You got to make a decision. You can't be lukewarm. A double-minded man will be destroyed. So I have here in the notes for verses, what are, oh yeah, yeah, for verses 9 through 10. Let's go back to James chapter 3. I was going to point out something, but I don't want to go on that. I don't want to go on that tangent. We got to wrap this lesson up, but remind me when we're leaving and I'll tell you. All right, let's pick this back up here at verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. All right, I have here in the notes for verses 9 through 10. You must have true repentance from your sins. And sin, again, is what? You not keeping the Torah. You must have true repentance from your sins. True repentance You'll mourn and weep, right? You'll humble yourselves before the Lord. Pick it up here in verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that thou judgest another? All right, so I have here in the notes for verses 11 through 12, Christians are to be doers or keepers of the law and not judges of the law. We will not become judges of the law until our time keeping slash doing the law is fulfilled. Then we will judge, right? When our obedience has been fulfilled, okay? There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, right? That is Jesus Christ, okay? Let's pick it back up here. Let's pick it back up here at verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? All right. This one lawgiver that is talking about is Christ. All right. Now, that's from the uh, conclusion. All right. Let's look at Isaiah 33 and verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Right. So the Lord is Israel's lawgiver and king. Christ is the king of Israel and therefore also the lawgiver. OK, Isaiah 44 and six. 
Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am, I am the first, and I am the last. And besides me, there is no God, right? So I have here in the notes. If Christ is the king of Israel, that means he is also God. This is Christ speaking in the Old Testament. Man has never dealt with the Father directly. Man has always been dealing with Christ. All right, Mark chapter 15 and verse 32. Let Christ, the king of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. All right, so notice here, the king of Israel, that's Christ. He's the lawgiver. So this royal law that you have to keep, Christ gave it, okay? All right, we almost finished. Don't worry, we're working our way through. And we're not gonna go past four. That's where we're gonna, we're gonna stop, whether we get there or not. But we almost, we almost done. Second Corinthians, we've gone this far. We might as well finish it, all right? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Again, remember I told you that Paul didn't like the church at Corinth. <laughs> Paul basically saying here, y'all been testing my gangster, and when I show up, I might have to show you my gangster. I would prefer not to show you my gangster, but you guys keep testing it. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's having the word of God and grafting in your mind when you bring every thought into captivity of Christ, right? You need to bring, you need to put, put every thought in your mind needs to be filtered through the lens of the Bible. So any thought that comes into your mind that goes against the knowledge of God or that goes against God's word, you need to cast that thought down. That's what Paul just said. Verse five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted, that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Notice here, Paul says, you need to be ready to revenge all disobedience, but when? when your obedience is fulfilled. So that's when Christians, the followers of Christ, will be judging people, right? That's going to be during Christ's thousand-year reign, right? And we're going to read it. So I have here in the notes, Christians are to be doers, are keepers of the law, and not judges of the law. We will not become judges of the law until our time keeping slash doing the law is fulfilled. Then we will judge, right? When our obedience has been fulfilled. So again, back here in Revelation 20, and we're not going to pick it up at verse 1. We read this already. We're just going to show you the part where it says you will be judging. All right, Revelation 20, and we're going to pick it up at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection, All right? Notice here, blessed and holy is he that hath power in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So notice here, we're going to be priests with him and judges, but that doesn't happen till the first resurrection. All right, let's go to Psalms chapter 149. Psalms chapter 149. And it's going to tell you the same thing here in Tanakh. That's actually the glory that we have or the reward that we have as saints, that we're going to be able to participate in the judgment. 
All right, it says here in verse one, praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with temporal and heart. All right, notice here who's doing this. This is the congregation of the saints. So this is the body of Christ. Verse four, for the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. All right, what does this mean? All right, this is the first resurrection when the saints awake from their sleep or death, right? When it's saying here bed, the bed is referring to the grave. This is talking about at the first resurrection. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. This is how you know this is during the thousand-year reign. I right? notice here it says a two-edged sword will be in their hand. All right, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. For what? To execute vengeance upon the heathen and the punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with feathers of iron. So you know how when Christ comes back, he's going to rule the earth, right? And be king of kings and rule the earth with a rod of iron and make all the world governments bow to him, right? The saints are going to help him do that. The saints are going to help him enforce making these world governments bow to him. You understand? Mm -hmm. All right, verse 8. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with feathers of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. So who gets this, this glory to execute the judgment upon these kings? Right? It's at the saints. Right? The saints are going to help Christ with this. This is when your obedience is fulfilled. When you've made the kingdom. That's how you know you 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 were obedient, right? I was obedient unto death. I, I woke up after dying. Where am I? I'm with Christ in the sky, coming down to invade. Then you know your obedience has been fulfilled. So it says here, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. All right, let's go back to James chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. James chapter 4. And we're going to pick it up at verse 13. Go now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Notice here, James is like, how come some of y'all make plans like I'm going to buy this house in a couple years? I'm going to do this. It's not nothing wrong with making goals and having that set. But don't be speaking as if you know you're going to even be alive the next day. You don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. And you talking about what you're going to do for five years from now. You don't even know if you're going to be alive on your birthday and you already talking about birthday week. Ooh, girl, we're going to be doing this. We're going to the Bahamas. We're going to Vegas. Me and all my girlfriends, my birthday week. Right? You don't even know if you're going to be alive during your birthday week. So when you're making plans, right, you want to be careful to not just assume that you'll even be alive during that time. All right, he says here, because remember, Jesus told you man's time is always ready, right? Remember Jesus said that? Your time is always ready, meaning you don't know when you're going to die. That could happen at any moment. Verse 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanish away. Notice here, he says your life is like a vapor. You know when you cook something and you see the steam float away? He says, that's what your life is like. In the grand scheme of things, you know, you only on this earth for a short period of time. It's like a drop in the bucket. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. That's why you'll hear me say a lot of times, Lord willing. And to be honest, remember, someone checked me on that before we even, whether before we started the church or whether after we started the church in the beginning. Someone checked me. It might have been even in the beginning of the church, but someone checked me. And actually said, you know, you you should be saying, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're right. Like, I should. You know what I'm saying? That's why. And that person, I forgot whoever it was. That's literally the reason. This is why sometimes you do. You have to correct people. You do. That's why the word of God says that. If you see someone correct, he saw it. He was like, yeah, you should really be saying, Lord willing. And he said that and showed it in the scripture, which I already knew. But I wasn't thinking of it at the time, not taking it as serious. Right. 
And so by him pointing it out, now y'all have noticed I say Lord willing all the time. Like Lord willing will be having Sabbath service next week. Lord willing will be having Q&A, right? Verse 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil, right? So boasting about stuff that you're going to do that you haven't even done yet, he says that's evil, right? Do not speak of future plans as if you know you will be alive to do that. Elohim is in control of everything, not you. You may die at any moment or... Yah might mess up whatever it is you are trying to do. So say, Lord willing. You don't know. The Lord may tr mess up your plans. All right. Verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So he said here, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay. If you know the Bible commands something and you willingly do not keep that commandment, you are a sinner. All right, I'm going to repeat. Let me put this in here. Where did it go? All right, I'm going to repeat. If you know the Bible commands something and you willingly do not keep that commandment, you are a sinner. That is why I always say we are handing out tickets. You know how I talk about handing out tickets? Once you give someone the knowledge of sin, right, they're supposed to now keep that commandment because now they know it's wrong. If they don't, there's no more mercy. There's nothing because they know, oh, man, I was supposed to do that. And they rejected the word of God. So that means now they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They've rejected God's word, right? And there is no saving for that. There can't be any, that sin cannot be forgiven. And it can't be forgiven because if you reject God's word, that means you're saying, I choose to live in sin. I choose to willfully disobey God's word because I don't believe God's word is correct. All right, Romans chapter 14, and we're gonna pick it up at verse 22. Romans 14 and verse 22, okay? It says here, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, let's go back to James now, chapter five, and we're gonna pick it up at verse one. I told y'all we were gonna do this whole lesson. All right, James chapter five, and we're gonna pick it up at verse one. James chapter five and verse one. Go to now, ye rich man, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Notice here, he's saying for the rich people, he's like, go and how, because you got miseries coming upon you. And then miseries coming upon them is talking about when Christ comes back at his second coming, because the rich has been the one that's mainly been oppressing everyone, right? Yeah. We don't have to make that, even with the, even when people be talking about the corporate elites, right? You know, and the globalists and all that, you know, like all that stuff, you know, Alex Jones type stuff, the globalists and the, you know, that Rand Paul, Ron Paul stuff, right? Who are these globalists? Who are these corporate elites? They're the wealthy, right? The super wealthy. That's what a corporate elite is, right? Anyways, these are the people who oppress you. He says here, verse two, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. The Lord of Sabbath, that's the Yahweh of hosts, the God of armies. Notice here, James is letting them know Elohim hears the cry of the poor. He hears the cry of the poor. He hears the cry of the exploited worker. He hears the cry of the proletariat, and guess what? Communism cannot save you, proletariat, from the bourgeois, right? You know what's going to save you from the bourgeois proletariat? When Christ comes back, right? So there is nothing man can do now to stop that. Jesus told you. Didn't Jesus tell you the poor you have with you always? They not going nowhere. You always going to have poor people and have poverty. It's going to be like that till the kingdom, till Christ comes back. 
All right, let's pick it back up here at verse 5. But notice here, remember his audience is the Jews, the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes suffer a lot of oppression, right? And we're in a lot of poverty, right? And we suffer a lot of oppression. And so he's letting them know, and he's letting the poor of the world know, Jesus hears what y'all going through. And when Jesus comes back at his second coming, he's going to destroy all these wealthy people who had been oppressing you. If you're wealthy, right, you shouldn't have nothing to worry about if you fear God and keep the commandments. Who the cap fit, let them wear it, right? If the cap don't fit you, then don't feel bad, okay? But if you super wealthy and you've been oppressing people, then the cap fits, right? Verse 5, because notice in verse 4, he said, too, these people haven't been paying these people right, right? They've been exploiting, been exploiting their labor, All right? Verse 5. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. So he was like, while you were alive, you lived in pleasure. Whatever you wanted, you got. You had wanton eyes. And whatever you want, you got. And you nourished up your heart. Ye have condemned and killed the just. And he that and he doeth, and he doth not resist you. Right? Because the people with money, even wars that happen, be over what? Money. People with money have vested interests. Right. And then you end up going to war and thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives are lost. Right. These are things that the wealthy that the wealthy do. Don't the wealthy kill people and get away with it because they wealthy. I got a better lawyer than you. I got more money than you. I'm going to get this case beat, even though I murdered you because I'm wealthy. All right. Verse seven. Be patient, therefore, brethren. So he's letting them know, be patient. Unto the coming of the Lord, because at Christ's second coming, he'll deal with this. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So I have here in the notes for what we just read here in verses one through eight. James acknowledges the oppression of the Gentiles and wealthy upon his audience, Christian Hebrews of the 12 tribes of Israel scattered globally via slavery. He comforts them, letting them, he comforts them, letting them know Christ and the Father both see the oppression, and Christ will save the children of Israel at his second advent, right? James invoked the Hebrew war title for Yahweh, it should be for our Yahweh, to remind the Israelites who fights for them, right? Because remember, his audience was who again? The 12 tribes of Israel. So he invokes the name of the Lord of hosts, right? Because they would know what that means, okay? The Lord of Sabaoth, Lord of the armies of Israel, as those who are under the leadership and protection of Jehovah maintain his cause in war, right? So that's why he it was actually a veil. That was almost, that could have also been like code. Because you know how the Romans, you know, if they the Romans didn't like the idea that they're going to get toppled, right? And that's why they tried to suppress Christianity. So James could have been putting that in there as code, too, for them, because the children of Israel would know what that means, literally. Someone else not going to know what that means. They're going to read that and be like, what, the Lord of Sabbath? The Lord of what? And then even the Lord of hosts, they don't know what that means. They think that's all fluffy. Nah, Lord of hosts means God of armies, God of war. You get what I'm saying? So the children of Israel reading this epistle would have known, oh, yeah, so you telling me when Christ comes back at his second coming, he's coming back to kick butt, the God of armies, when he's going to do finally what we've been waiting on, topple these Gentiles and establish the kingdom for the children of Israel, right? And put the children of Israel on top for Christ's thousand-year reign. All right. Do, do, do. It's of Hebrew origin, right? comes from the root of Strong's Hebrew 6635, even though this is in the New Testament, when the New Testament was in Greek. The root of this goes back to the Strong's Hebrew 6635. It means army, sabbath, or tas sabbath, a military epithet of God, sabbath, all right? Let's go to Revelation 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 9. And the reason why we're going here is because this is why James had to say what he said to the children of Israel, all right? Why you have to tell them the Lord sees that you're poor, but he's going to deliver you out of your oppression and out of your poverty when he comes back at his second coming. I know some of my people in the flesh don't like to hear that because it sounds like pie in the sky. Why we got to wait? Whoop -de -whoop -de -whoop. 
Well, that's what I believe because it's in the Bible. So I'm going to wait for Christ to come back and I'm not going to try to jump the gun and do nothing in advance. Protesting, pointless. Rebellions, pointless. If you want to make a change, fear God and keep the commandments. You know how we sing that song? We sing the same songs all the time. We shall overcome. We've been saying that. We ain't overcome nothing, right? What's the other one? A change going to come. A change ain't going to come. A change not going to come for my people, right, until we start fearing God and keeping the commandments. Then a change will come. Revelation 2 and 9. I know thy works in tribulation, right? When he says here, tribulation is talking about oppression and poverty. That Y'all know what poverty is, right? But thou art rich. Why is Jesus saying to them here, they are rich? Because they are the real Jews. And unto the real Jews and the real Israelites were given what? The oracles of God. So they are rich in holy things. If the children of Israel would only realize this. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not. And are the synagogue of Satan. So notice here, he lets you know there's going to be some people who call themselves Jews but they're not real Jews and they are of the synagogue of Satan, right? And he lets you know where you're going to find them. You're going to find them in the synagogue and he lets you know they're going to be the opposite of the real Jews. The real Jews are going to be mostly in poverty, right? These fake ones are going to be wealthy. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. I digress. So let's look at the two. You have one group they get wealth. Most of them are in poverty and they only get wealthy through rapping and playing basketball. Then you have another group who say they Jews and they are wealth. They are wealthy. You know, with the other group, the few of them who get wealthy play basketball and rap and stuff. Right. And most of them in poverty, the other group, most of them are wealthy and they're doctors and, you know, lawyers and uh, landlords and bankers. And they run Hollywood and control Hollywood and the media and journalism and so forth i digress revelation 3 and 9 behold i will make them of the synagogue of satan which say they are jews and are not but do lie behold i will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that i have loved thee right and that's going to happen when i didn't revelation 3 9 that's going to happen at christ's second coming when the lord of sabbath not lord of sabbath the lord of sabbath sabbath Right, the Yahweh of hosts, the God of armies, when he comes. Okay, all right, let's close out James chapter five, and we're going to pick it up at verse nine. And this is the conclusion of the book of James. Right, James chapter five and verse nine Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Right, and the judge is Christ, and he's letting you know, Christ, you know. We are already in the last days, right? And so Christ is coming back soon. So he says here, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door, right? Don't hold grudges with people. Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Notice here, he says the prophets, they suffered much affliction, Right? And we we reading about the prophets now in the Old Testament on Bible study. We're doing Ezekiel. Before this, we did Haggai. We did Habakkuk. You know what I'm talking about? We've been going through them, right? And they suffer oppression at the hands of the people. So he's saying here, if the prophets could suffer that oppression and not hold a grudge, right, then you should be able to do the same thing. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and tender to mercy. When he says here, the Lord is very pitiful, meaning the Lord will have pity on you. And remember, Job didn't do anything. All right? So I have here in verses 9 through 11, through 11, just like God eventually delivered the prophet Job after much suffering, he will eventually deliver the real Jews or Israelites. All right? Verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not. Neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. And condemnation means you go into the lake of fire. That's why he said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, right? No, he was talking about the thumpity thump. Boom, 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 boom. You don't need to hear any instruments or nothing. All you need to hear is thumpity thump, thump. All right. 
let's pick it back up here at verse where are we at the thumpity thump thump threw me off but above all things my brethren swear not neither by heaven neither by the earth neither by any other oath but let your yea be yea and your nay nay lest ye fall into condemnation all right so i have here in the notes for verse 12 a, the torah reference why he says this because again it's in torah and remember james throughout this book has been telling you you need to keep the royal law you want to know what the royal law is you have to go into torah so here we go numbers 30 and 2 if a man vow a vow unto the lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond he shall not break his word he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth so that's why james told them don't even make vows unless you have to don't make a vow because if you make a vow you're gonna have to keep it right let your yea be yea and your nay be nay all right let's look at a reference from the tanakh right ecclesiastes chapter five and this is the main one why you don't want to you know you want to be careful what you say and you don't want to just make willy-nilly vows okay and you don't want to swear you know, even that's why when I'm out, if I hear a brother, I'm talking about my kinsman in the flesh because we say it a lot. I swear on God, my ninja, on God, my ninja. I swear to God, my ninja. They say it all the time. I will say something. I'll be like, you shouldn't say that. What are you swearing to? You're not supposed to swear. You don't know how serious that is. And remember, didn't we cover earlier in this lesson about how you're going to have to give an account of every idle word that you spoke? Yeah. All right, this stuff's not a game. All right. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay thou which pay that which thou hast vowed. So if you've made a vow, don't lollygag on it. Do the vow that you done said you're gonna do. All right. I use the example of people being engaged, because that one happens a lot nowadays. You'd be engaged for five, six, seven years, and then the marriage never ends up happening, right? You that vow, that engagement, that betrothal, that's a vow, right? And not just even with being engaged, any vow. You make a vow, do your best to pay that vow as quickly as possible. Whatever it is you vow to do, you need to be trying to complete that vow as quickly as possible. You get what I'm saying? You know how you promise to someone, oh, I'm going to mow your lawn on this day. Then you better show up and mow their lawn on that day or tell them why, right? I digress. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he have no pleasure in fools. But that which thou hast vowed, better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Because when you make a vow, Elohim heard that and the angel heard that. You feel me? And they're going to require it of you. And if you don't pay, then God is going to send that angel to do you harm. All right now, let's go back into James chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. James chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Notice here, Elijah prayed earnestly and it didn't rain on the earth for three and a half years. But James just told us he was a man subject to like passions like us. That means he didn't have, Elijah doesn't have any more power than we have. You just have to have faith and it needs to be necessary. It's not necessary for most of us to make it stop raining for three and a half years, right? It's not necessary for us to move a mountain, right? But if the time came and it was necessary for us to move the mountain, if we have faith, then that mountain will be removed. All right, verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, 
and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. So I have here in the notes the healing ministry and op the healing ministry and operation of miracles within the church. Here, James is giving them instructions. Anoint people with oil. Pray for the sick. You know how some people think healing is not a, like miracles are not done anymore in the church? No, there's still miracles. And you still need to pray for the sick and the sick can be healed. All right. All sickness. You got to have faith and believe. Right. Not saying it's not saying it's going to happen all the time. Everything is in God's hands, but it can happen. You get what I'm saying? So you need to have you need if you sick, you need to get prayer. OK, that's what church is for. Some of y'all be sick and just be whole and <laughs> and not letting no one know. Like, no, this is one of the things. Literally, if you're not feeling well, get prayer. That's what the church is for. Like, that's what church is for. And the pastor, the elders, the teachers, we're supposed to pray for you, right? So he says here, he gives them instructions on the operation of the healing ministry in the church, right? So you are supposed to do that. Pray for one another. Pray for the sick, right? Now, self-explanatory. Let's pick it up here at verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. All right, so I have here in the notes a Torah reference for this, okay? So notice here, James said, and then we're going to close out. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. So if you see a brother and they start sinning, they stop keeping the commandments and you see them sinning, and then you go and tell them, hey, man, you can't do that. And you show them that in the scriptures. And then they stop doing it. It says, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. Right. So you save that man from going to the lake of fire and the Lord killing him. But what else did you do for yourself? And shall hide a multitude of sins, your own sins. Right. Talking about that's talking about for you. Right. And shall hide a multitude of your own sins because the Lord is not going to require his blood at your hands. All right. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse one or five and one Leviticus five and one. This is a Torah reference. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness, whether he have seen or known of it, he do not utter it. Then he shall bear his iniquity. So notice here, if you hear someone or see someone else sin, it is witness to it. Right. And it says here, and if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness, right, whether he have seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Right. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter three and the same thing. If you see a brother, why did I put that over there? If you see a brother sinning, you're supposed to let him know, hey, you can't do that. That's not judging either. You're not judging someone because you're not the one judging them. If you bring out the Bible, did you judge them? Think about what I said. If you bring out the Bible, did you judge them? No, the Bible judged them, right? So let's look here in Ezekiel 3 and 17, and this is where we're going to close out. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked and turn not, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when I notice here, thou hast delivered thy soul, just like James said, you will have hide, you will have hidden a bunch of your own sins. All right, verse 20, meaning you'll have a, your own sins covered. Verse 20, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, notice here, warn the righteous that the righteous sin not. Okay, because righteousness is keeping the commandments. And he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. 
also thou hast delivered thy soul. All right. So that's what James meant at the end of James. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. We're going to close out with prayer and then we're going to do these. We're going to run through these announcements. Since we went this far, we're going to do the announcements too. Since we went this far. All right. Let's close out with prayer, then we'll do the announcements. Okay. Let's uh, face Jerusalem. Y'all can stand and face Jerusalem. I'm going to turn and we're going to close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come together as members of the body of Christ to study the book of James, the epistle of James, to learn it and to study it, especially on your Shabbat, on your Sabbath, to hold a convocation as we were commanded. We pray, Father God, that the word that went forth, that it fell on fertile ground, were to be watered and nurtured and lead the fruits of repentance and works of righteousness so that we can make the kingdom and make the first resurrection. We pray, Father God, that we do not add to your word and that we do not take away from your word, but that we taught your word line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And again, we ask for a blessing for the reading, hearing, and doing of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Really quickly, announcements. All right. Join us for Q&A slash prayer service every third day of the week or what Babylon calls Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central. Try to get your questions in in advance if you can, because I don't want to just pop up on the screen looking like Boo Boo the Fool when there, if there ain't no questions, you know, just looking at the screen. All right. And I don't always want to, I don't always want to have to pull a lesson out of a hat, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat. All right. Join us for Bible study every Shabbat Eve or what Babylon calls Friday at 7 p.m. Central. And you can join us every week on the Sabbath at noon central time for our Shabbat convocation service. Okay, you can watch us on the church website, which is www.firstresurrectionfellowship.com. You can also watch us on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. You can contact the church via email at firstresurrectionfellowship at gmail.com, or you can text or call the church at 901-410-3010. Join us every Sabbath at 2 p.m. Pacific time. So that's 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Mountain, right? So now, basically, join us every Sabbath at 2 p.m. Pacific time for First Resurrection Fellowship SoCal's lesson. That's Southern California with Brother Daryl. You can watch them on the church website. So you can watch them at www.firstresurrectionfellowship.com or you can watch them on their YouTube page as well. And we have a link to their YouTube page on our, um, we have a link to their YouTube page on our YouTube. All right. Also, if you want to come fellowship with us on person in person for the feast days, let us know. Uh, oh, yeah. Again, for the people who we sent the email to about coming in person, that wasn't like trying to make anyone feel like they're obligated to come. It was just inviting you to come if you want to come because you're all the people who live the closest in the area and who I talk to the most or follow us the most. So if you want to come, come. If not, it's fine. All right. But I'll just letting you know you're invited. And so we can know in advance, too, for planning for um, food. Right. So if you want to come for the next feast, which is Pentecost, please let us know if you plan on attending. Also, if you just plan on attending for the regular Sabbath service or Bible study, the church's address is 5405 Fox Plaza Drive. Unit 108F, Memphis, Tennessee, 38115, if you would like to come fellowship with us in person. All right. Is there any other announcements? Nope. All right. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath.